good evening, everyone. Oh. Welcome. Uh, this evening, uh, for those of you who have copies of the warrant, uh, we're going to be covering warrant articles number 1 through 8, 10 through 13, and 36 through 41. So uh, warrant articles 9 and 14 through 35 are going to be covered on Thursday. So if anyone is here for any of those specific warrant articles, uh, we will not be addressing them tonight. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Mr. Town Manager. Hey, Mr. Chair. Thursday night will be the public works show. Tonight is the non-public works show. Um, and uh, I turn, once I turn this on, we dive right in. I won't spend much time at all on this slide, uh, more just to show the, the, the process that we go through each year. Um, you know, much like the budget process, the warrant uh, construction process is, is a lengthy process. It starts with the free cash certification in January. Um, you know, as, as everybody I think in this room knows, um, we use our free cash to fund capital, um, which is consistent with, with longstanding practice. Um, so getting that certification from the state in December, early January is an important milestone for us. Um, you'll see in the middle of the slide there, we're in the, uh, uh, obviously we're in the Finance Committee warrant review process. Um, the selectmen wrapped up their uh, warrant review um, on uh, the 17th and Selectman Langley is here representing the board tonight. Um, it can probably answer any questions that you have about uh, the, uh, the votes that were taken or the discussion that took place. Um, then looking ahead, we'll have our skull session on the 15th, uh, town meeting school on the 16th, and of course town meeting on the third Monday in May. And before we dive in, um, we spent a few minutes with the Board of Selectmen uh, providing some context and, and sort of high level overview of the process and where we are this year. Um, so what you see on the slide is uh, kind of an excerpted uh, version of um, what you'll find on page 25 of the warrant book, which is our uh, funding sources breakout uh, for all the articles and the budgets and things like that. And I think, um, you know, what we wanted to point out on this slide, uh, this, this is similar to a slide that we talked about during the budget presentation. It's been um, fleshed out a little bit more now that we have the warrant put together. Um, but two years ago, we had, a, we had a pretty strong free cash number. Actually, the last three years, we have a $6.5 million free cash number. Three years ago, $7.1 million free cash number in 18, which would have funded the 19 budget, um, and about a $5.2 million free cash number uh, for, 18, for 19, which is what would fund, I'm sorry, for 18, which is what would fund the 20 request. So what you see um, moving from left to right, uh, what was approved in last year's town meeting, what was requested going into this year's town meeting. In the blue, you'll see what's being recommended. Um, this is based on available funds and maintaining compliance with certain financial policies that the town has. And the red on the far right is sort of self-explanatory. Um, you know, when you rely on free cash to fund your ongoing infrastructure, um, you, you, you do what you can based on the certification that you receive. So. Um, we had about $2.6 million worth of capital projects that were requested by departments this year based on our plans. Um, these are not projects that sort of come along um, without planning. These are pavement management. This is roof. We have a roof replacement schedule. Um, we have a technology replacement plan. We have a five-year capital plan. And so based on those plans and based on what professional staff see in the community as needs, they put together their requests. And you, know, you can see we're funding about $3.2 million um, of close to $6 million in requests this year. Uh, and, and we'll talk, uh, you'll see some asterisks on the screen. Um, and part of how we're funding our tech warrant, buildings warrant, and grounds warrant this year um, is utilizing some savings from previous year's warrant, uh, warrants in those particular categories. And moving on to the next slide, um, you know, we spend a lot of time during the financial summit and sort of in passing discussing what you see on the screen, but we wanted to take just a minute to check in and provide kind of a big picture overview of where we are in terms of some of our reserves. Uh, the reserves are a critical um, part of our financial management, uh, something that the auditors pay close attention to. It's certainly something that the rating agencies pay close attention to. Um, and uh, you know, we're, we're gearing up for a, for a pretty large debt issuance um, this year. And so the, you know, the policies are particularly important in the year where you're going to be going out to the market and trying to present you know, your best case. Um, and so what, you're, what you see here uh, just sort of top to bottom, um, this 5.2, this is our certified free cash number. Uh, the 4.044 is what we're recommending be appropriated at this town meeting, and that number is a little bit misleading, and I'll explain why uh, in a minute. 
Um, but that would leave us with $1.1 million in free cash coming out of town meeting, which you can see here is consistent with the town's policy adopted in 16, which says that you know, no less than 1% of our operating revenues will, be, will remain in free cash coming out of the town meeting. So we're complying with that policy. We have similar policies for our water retained earnings in the water budget and our sewer retained earnings in the sewer budget. Um, our certified retained earnings this year were pretty similar for both um, uh, enterprise funds. We're, likewise, we're recommending comparable amounts coming out for the, for the town meeting. You'll see what the balances are at the end of town meeting. The policies in these two proprietary funds are uh, to be at 10% of net operating. Um, you'll, you'll see here that we are going to be slightly out of compliance with our water policy at the end of town meeting. Um, the reason for that is sort of twofold. We started to talk about it during the budget presentation, but you know, s through regulation, sales continue to decline in water. Um, so if we did nothing this year, rates go up to support the fact that we're selling less water. But things don't remain the same. We have aging infrastructure. We have critical projects we have to do. We have collective bargaining agreements that have to be honored. And so, you know, we we whittled down uh, what was, as you you can see, close to 1.4 million dollars in in water distribution projects, and we're proposing to do about 800 thousand dollars worth this year. Um, we will, you know, we will aim to work with the Water and Sewer Commission to be in compliance with this policy at the end of the year. But that's going to be part of the rate setting process uh, later this spring. We're in a little better shape on the sewer side, but I would caution everybody that you know, we belong to the South Essex Sewer District and we have a couple of sizable capital projects coming to us from, from their capital planning uh, side and those, um, those also have an impact on retained earnings. So that's the top half. Look at the bottom half. The other, the other number we talk about a lot is our unassigned fund balance. This is what the auditors look at. We have an established policy in Danvers that will try to maintain between 8 and 12 percent of our net operating revenue. Um, in that uh, unassigned fund balance category. Um, our certified uh, fu unassigned fund balance in the audit that we just completed was $8.8 .8 million, which is just about 8.5%. Um, you'll see the difference here, 4.4 million in free cash being used versus 2.5 that we're showing here as a debit against the unassigned fund balance. The reason for that is one of the articles we're gonna discuss tonight is a transfer from free cash to the general stabilization fund. Um, in an effort to continue to build the stabilization fund. And both of those categories fall under free uh, unassigned fund balance, so it shows there's no reduction in unassigned fund balance. It's simply a shift from one category to the other within that. So this is really the, the amount of our free cash number that's being proposed at this town meeting, which will put us in a position coming out of town meeting based on last year's audit of about six, a little under six and a half million dollars in unassigned fund balance. As a percent of our operating budget, that's about 6%. So we, we know that we are out of compliance with our own policy coming out of town meeting. Um, why are we able to do that? Well, that has in part is due to the way that we, our budget is structured and the way that we fund from year to year. So you know, we, have, we have had positive operating results of no less than $3 million over the last three years, but you'll notice a pretty consistent trend here. Uh, three years ago, uh, between revenue and expenditure, we turned back $5 million. In, end of 17, 4.3. End of 18, 3.09. Ronnie's water bottle is doing strange things to my laser. Um, we, so we don't have our FY19 numbers yet. We've, we've trended those out you know, two or three or four times to make sure we think we know where we're going. Um, we're, we're, we're very confident we're going to have a positive year in result this year. The question is where we're going to land. And you can see here um, we're going to need positive operating results of $2.1 million to get back to um, our uh, stated uh, fund balance policy. So um, the, I, I think the point is that this is this is a somewhat precarious position to put yourself in each year as you prepare for the next year's budget. Um, and, you know, you can't really ship this on a dime, but it's something I think, you know, we need to be mindful of as we're, as we're looking ahead, um, which is a totally planned and segue into the next slide, I'll admit. Um, but as we think about kind of where we are and where we're going long term, we're going to be talking about the Highland School roof on Thursday. You know, that's a project we have to do this year. Um, we know that the Riverside roof is right behind it in terms of needing to be replaced. Um, you have some, some categories in the middle of this slide that show, if we, you know, just based on current trend and budget uh, expenditures, sort of where, what we think we're going to need over the next three or four years for our buildings maintenance and our grounds improvements and the technology plan. Uh, we have our OPEB trust in the middle of the slide here. This $1.75 reflects about that we, we currently fund $350,000 a year 
um, out of free cash, and I'll point two things out there. First, I think you know, we're, we're getting credit for funding this trust, but we're not funding it adequately at this point. We need to be doing more. Um, and for the same reason that it's precarious to be coming out of, you know, going into each closeout hoping to have positive results to, to maintain compliance with the policy, we don't have anything in our tax-supported budget going toward OPEP. So anything we're contributing toward OPEP currently is coming out of free cash. Um, that's not a position that we're, you know, is, is, is a sustainable long-term, but it's, it's kind of the best we could do right now, and, and we're getting full credit for that. But I think, again, we want to point that out as something we need to be thinking about moving forward. Uh, this $1.78 million that we're looking ahead on school stabilization, um, that would be to uh, hit a, uh, the $8.3 million mark that we talked about earlier this year, particularly with the board, as we think about funding um, the Smith School leveled that over 30 years. Um, that has the lowest impact on the early years of debt service. It shifts a lot of interest costs to the out years of the debt service. Um, but we'll need to put another close to $2 million in that stabilization fund over the next five or six years to be able to maintain that, that most conservative funding schedule for Smith School. Um, the dredging project we'll talk about, um, I think that'll be on Thursday as well. <coughs> So we're about you know, we're eight or nine years away from our last dredging project. You know, we did our last one eight nine years ago. This is now on the horizon. Uh, we did two rivers last time. We need to do all four this time. So it's that's a sizable project that's coming our way. Um, and the placeholders down here at the bottom are projects we've discussed. But you know these are these are sort of out there as as conversation points. But there's no no timing, no budget, no locations, anything like that. But um, you know also on the horizon. Um, at the last, so I'll, I'll, this was discussed by the board in brief, you know, at, the, at their warrant review. Um, they did ask that staff sort of circle back and revisit the conversation we had around the holidays in terms of our short-term and long-term financial planning um, and scenarios and things like that. So um, we're aiming for probably June time frame to, to kind of put together another check-in and presentation for the board and we'll extend invitations to the finance committee as well when we start to prepare for that. So. Um, we can take any questions you guys have on the big picture stuff before we launch into um, very specific things like unpaid bills and uh, town officers. Ken? Um, just to get an idea on trends, it, have we been sort of planning to have a budget surplus every, like when, has it been fairly routine that we've sort of dipped below that 8% to down to like where we are six this year? planning on having a surplus because we've done it historically yeah so we that's not new this year it's that's not a, it's not unusual to dip below the eight coming out so um, as I said we had a you know we had a very strong free cash number two years ago and, and um, consequently town meeting we, we funded we actually caught up on some things we, we funded a couple of large pieces of capital equipment in Dell public works last year we usually do one large piece a year so we we use our reserves um, but, but absolutely, we, we assume positive results, and that's been a long-standing kind of financial okay. strategy in town, is that we're, we're very conservative on our non-tax revenue, um, which works until it doesn't, until there's a disruption to a market or you get a recession or something like that, and then, it, then you, you find out. I mean, the, when we, we're focused on sustainability. Right. What we're doing works. I don't know how sustainable it is, and that's the conversation I think we want to kind of get into. And then on the capital outlay <coughs> on the first slide? The, what's sort of like the, I don't know, five or ten year average? Obviously, that's a big, like, how how much muscle are you guys cutting into? Yeah, so the... Reducing that by two and a half million dollars versus last year. I think it, 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 the answer is it kind of depends from category to category. Um, the, did we put capital out of on here? I don't know that we did. I want to say, we, you know, we've averaged about three quarter million dollars a year for capital outlay. Um, so you know nine nine you know a million dollars was kind of a high water mark that was based on a strong free cash number. This I'm is sorry, little, I meant more. I meant yeah. I'm, I'm using the wrong terminology. I meant I was looking at the bot at the totals down at the bottom. Yeah, yeah. Well, so th it's a little misleading because these are these are rate supported at the bottom. Okay. So water and sewer are, are rate supported. This is what our plans say we should be spending. This is what we're able to spend based on retained earnings. So part of what water and sewer commission is going to be wrestling this with year this year is it probably a pretty sizable rate increase. Mm -hmm to start to rebuild that retained earnings number because we, we have to have that. Um, so for the bottom two, that's a little bit different than the top bunch. Capital outlays we've discussed. This has always, this has been a free cash supported budget category for as long as I, you know, for as far back as we've looked. If, if we have an opportunity, 
you know, we would we would be strongly recommending that we carve out some tax levy real estate to fund capital because we know that our capital number will never be zero in any given year. It may not be a million, but it certainly won't be zero. Um, this these numbers tend to fluctuate. I can talk about some of the specific. The ground this 750 is a particularly large request for grounds. Part of the reason for that is that David Mountain and Travis Reardon, David Mountain is our recreation director, Travis Reardon is our director of, uh, he's our supervisor for forestry and grounds. The Twy field is starting to show its age and they both recommended a, essentially a complete rebuild of that field. You know, putting in better drainage, laser leveling it, rebuilding the infield. That's about a $200,000 project. And there, you know, our total budget for grounds this year is 165,000. So 40 of that is to redo the infield but we can't touch the full project based on you know kind of where we are. So, you know that it's arguable whether that rises to the level of a of a need. But you know we've often we often talk about our fields as being part of our infrastructure. And we sort of we try to maintain those the same way we do our roads and sidewalks because they get a lot of mileage and we want to you, you put money into them and if you don't maintain them then they then they get more and more expensive moving forward. So, um, and, and then the last question. Um, I know obviously last year we thought Highlands is going to be 1.6. Have we? vetted the Riverside project? So we're like, sim like, you know, we had the architect come in at Highlands and the ticket price went up. Yeah. Are we confident in that Riverside number or could that get, move on us too? That's, I think that's a great question. And what I'll say is that, w you know, we're still a year out from putting this before you guys. So we will do some of the, we'll get it, we'll go a little further into the engineering work on that one. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. So we won't, and, and I'd, I'd like to save this conversation for David Lane to be here, but I think, we, you know, we, he, he certainly was stunned when we started getting into that roof structure, finding that things had just been skimmed over that were 55 plus years old. So that we'll, we'll certainly be ready to have that conversation. Absolutely. Any other questions? I, I have uh, some on the list of capital um, projects. Right here? Or yes. Yeah. Uh, no, not that one. Um, this yes thank you so the the fy20 requested that's by that you mean like department heads and um <clears throat> the town if you will that was what was requested the 5.9 million but what's in the warrant article is the 3.2 i just wanted to make sure i'm understanding the column that's right okay and then going back to the uh key reserve slide um so we get down to that bottom right compliant question mark to be determined. And of course, that concerns me, especially where the number below it is a negative number. It's, it's to be determined once we have the actual free cash or unassigned fund balances number. And, and when, when would that number be available? Well, the, so it, it'll, yeah, go ahead, Ronnie. So it'll be once FY19 closes and the books are closed, we'll be able to determine that number. Is there, you, are you, is there a chance that we'll be um, in the negative? There's always a chance that yeah. we'll be in the negative. So I could point out, so it, it's a, it's hard to see, but it's just, that's a squiggly mark, which is meant to say approximately 2.1. Oh. It's not a negative. Okay. But it is a negative in the sense that we need to generate that um, at year's end to bring that 6% up to 8%. But and just to clarify, we won't have a negative free cash certification if that was that, a question. That's, no. that was, that was my question. Yeah. So what does that bottom line mean, plus revenue over expenditure to 8%? What's that, um, the, the squiggly 2.14 that I was afraid was a negative 2.14? If you take, if you take, so the 6.46 million is our, is our unassigned fund balance that was audited last year, minus the, the free cash dollars that we're proposing to spend at town meeting, and then that leaves us at 6.4 coming out of town meeting. Based on the budget that was approved by the board and the finance committee, um, we can calculate what 8% of that budget looks like, and we have to cover the distance between 8% of that budget and where we would be sitting today. So if you were to add 2.14 million to the 6.461 million, it would get us to, to the 8%. Okay. And those numbers, are, those numbers are rounded at this point because as, as Ronnie indicated, you know, this is when the books close on June 30, we'll have a number of revenue categories that have, have exceeded the budgeted uh, projection, and we'll have a number of expenditure uh, categories that will come in below, and the sum of those is what you see at the bottom of the screen. So that projected balance of the 6.461 is 
six six percent of the operating budget. So the other two percent will need to come from positive results. Got it. Because we our policy is to have that number be eight percent. Eight to twelve is our range that we aim for. And one of the reasons for that number being as high as eight to twelve percent is because we use that money for capital um, outlay at, traditionally. That's been the, the approach. I think, you know, as staff, if we could get to a point where, you know, and we'll talk, when we talk at the end of the meeting about what we're proposing to move from free cash into general stabilization fund, I think in a, you know, in a perfect world we would build that stabilization fund to be close to the 8% on its own, and then we would just adjust it for inflation each year so that free cash were truly free cash and we weren't so heavily reliant on the free cash certification each year because it, I think it's... Um, it's a, it's a somewhat volatile place to be. Mm -hmm. it's, it's harder to sustain disruptions if you're relying heavily on plus positive the results. Plus the timing of when that's certified as opposed to when we're developing the budget, uh, it just doesn't, the timing isn't, isn't good for such a great unknown figure out there. How about the state's, um, the, the um, funding from the state, that number is still pending, unknown, right? So, so that's another number that kind of floats that's a significant number to us, but we don't have an exact number until after we set the budget, right? Well, we do know the house. You can share the house projection at this point. Yeah, so the house, it was a net, I think, a $2,000 difference. We ended up getting some more Chapter 70. Our charter assessment went up by a similar amount. So based on the difference between the governor and the house budget, is about 2000 Historically, we budget based on the governor's budget because, generally speaking, knock on wood, it only goes up once it goes through the house and the Senate. <laughs> okay, thank you. Any other questions? Paul. Thank you. Go back. Could you go back to slide one? Uh, <clears throat> on the bottom, the, the 2646 is basically what you're not funding. But if you look at the, the bottom two categories, that's all water and sewer, correct? So what we're really looking at, unless I misunderstand, is the free cash part of it is above those two numbers, correct? Yeah, we've, we've included them here because retained earnings functions a lot like free cash for the, for the enterprise right. funds. But you're at about 1.6 million at this cutoff here. And, I, and I, I can't remember back, but in the past years, do you have a reference as to the number, the size of that number at the bottom, 2.646? Is that unusual or is that about what we decide on a yearly basis to hold back, maybe not fund and put off? It, it fluctuates, Paul. I, I think this is, this is a little bit higher, and yeah. I think the reason for that is, again, twofold. One, our, our free cash certification dropped about $2 million this year. Um, and, you know, the, the, the point we'd make, we have pavement management on here. The, the request was 477000 I mean, based on our pavement management plan, that request should have been north of a million dollars because that's... If we're trying to maintain the roads, you know, we, we rate each each inch of road in town on a 100-point scale, and we try to maintain a certain rideability on all of our roads, and we try to rebuild roads starting at the bottom of that list. And each year we're looking at, we, we, we look at the numbers, and then we go out and put eyes on the road to see what's changed over the winter, and that's how we build our cap our, our maintenance plan for the year. You know, we're, we're a million dollars behind in our in our pavement plan. So the request was 477, but the plan would have supported a much higher request and you know we did 288 last year, and to be clear, this is in this is in addition to the close to 900,000 that we get from the state under Chapter 90 for you know for, mm -hmm. for roads that qualify for Chapter 90. This kind of fills in the gaps, um, but you know we, we could we could defend a lot more uh, to be to be invested back into the roads based on the plans that we have. So when we when we um, I guess come June 30th rolls around, we're going to have a. An, an understanding or a figure as to where we actually are with free cash at that point or not? Uh, more like December. Because on, on July, we close the books on June 30. There's about a month to take care of loose ends. And okay. then in the fall, the auditors come in and work with Rodney and the accounting team okay. to start vetting all that. So that's why we get our certification. You know, for the year that ended June 30, 2018, we got our number back from the state in January of 19. So it's a process. Okay. I guess what I'm driving at is. Is it, a, is, it, is, it a, is it a stretch to think that we can make it up, make up the free cash, that 
that we need. I mean, it doesn't sound to me like we're where we really want to be with free cash, putting it bluntly. At the end of this year, and looking into next year, are we going to have $6 million to work with or something like that? And, and, and how do we do that? I mean, just this seems to me to be a reserve fund that we depend on heavily. Call it free cash, but it's not. Uh, it's money that we have to find okay. somewhere. It's positive operating results at, each, at the end of each year. And that money comes from? Revenue exceeding projection and expenditure coming so in. So if we, we, if, we, if we put out a project and we end up saving $250,000, it goes into free cash. Not necessarily. No? It'll sit in a capital account until it's moved. This is more like we budget, we budget about $800,000 a year yeah. for snow removal. Hmm. The, well, give, that's budget. a good example. Yeah. We have a mild winter. They're going to turn back half of that. And that goes to? Free cash. Free cash. Three winters ago, we spent $2 million on our snow, <laughs> so we had about a $1.2 <laughs> million dollar hole we had to fill. All so right. that, that's the problem with relying on these. Right. Um, you know, Rich's department generates, you know, they, they routinely beat uh, revenue. Um, that's by design. But if, if the housing market catches a cold next year, I mean, that'll be a sizable hit in sure. our, our year-end revenue. People um, stop buying cars. And car, yeah, you name it. So that's stuff, yeah. when we talk about, you know, you can see based on recent performance, odds are good we're going to be able to cover that gap. But the but the point I think, and I think we're kind of leading into the conversation in June is, for how long is that sustainable? Um, you know, we 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 know that residents value highly the services they get, um, but covering our ongoing costs. I mean, we have we have drivers in the budget that are beyond. Um, the, the, the normal, you know, two and a half means, and, the, and, and at some point we have to wrestle with what is the, not next year, but what does 10 years from now look like? And how, and well, how see, we, we're how closing we in on 12 in. years post-2008. Yeah, the recession is, we, we still reference the recession as if it was just yesterday, but right. you're right, it was and, a long time. Uh, I, somehow I get the feeling that when we talk about all the things we want to do and we have to do, there's a spiral. So, you know, you get caught in a whirlpool, and it gets faster and faster and faster, and at some point, you're in it. And now you wonder, how the heck are you going to get out of it? And that's what concerns me a little bit. Uh, and I don't have any answers, to be honest with you, other than to be cautionary um, with how we spend. So I just, it just, I have to tell you that I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little nervous, uh, and I don't want to strike fear in anybody, but I am nervous. Well, this is a lot of doom and gloom, and I don't want to strike fear in the hearts of anybody. That, we can talk about that in June. We should get back on a more optimistic Okay, I note. apologize. And to your point about long term, I think, you know, nobody, nobody sitting on this side of the table wants to give any indication that the sky is falling or, or, or there's mm. a, you know, doom out there. I, I, I love the quote, you know, that a, a much more seasoned manager than I am came, you know, shared with me a long time ago. He said, we can do anything, but we can't do everything. Right. And that's the conversation I think we're getting, we're inching towards. Well, that's what I'm driving at. Yep. I'm seriously, because I, 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 I listen to projects that are out there and, and they all, everything is great, but I know one thing that the, I, I feel quite confident that you, what's been mentioned is that people expect services, and I think some of them are very basic services. They want to they have schools, they want to have roads, they want their trash picked up, they want fire, police protection, et cetera, and those are basics. Now, beyond that, then I think then you have to say, okay, where are we? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Any other comments? Okay. On to the special town meeting. We'll start with a $649 unpaid bill <laughs> from the prior fiscal year. Um, a, a few years back, everybody sh should remember the, the Commonwealth converted to a pay-by-plate system for vehicles going in and out of Boston. Um, we didn't have transponders in our vehicles, so we were uh, um, I won't make a, a, a short story long, but we have a $649 invoice due to the state uh, DOT for a combination of uh, tolls and penalties. Um, we have rectified this issue. Uh, we argued this uh, uh, to the bitter end and, and to no you know, avail. So at this point, um, we're recommending that the town meeting approve this $649 uh, uh, payment. It does require nine-tenths vote at town meeting. Um, if it fails, I don't mind making the call to the state that we uh, were unable to garner a 90% support for the $649 unpaid bill. Um, but they will. But our understanding is they may not let us re-register our vehicles uh, <laughs> moving forward if we don't pay it. So why a 90% approval? Nine, unpaid bills require nine-tenths approval. Prior. Like it's a good motivator to, to pay.
pay our bills on time because it's, nobody likes to go to town meeting and explain why we have an unpaid bill from a prior fiscal year. But this is one we were fighting and fighting and fighting and we finally gave up on. Any comments? <laughs> just curious. You were fighting it because you felt it was unjust or because you just didn't want for the town to have to give up $649? It wasn't really about the money. I'll let David Lane explain that on Thursday. But it was, we thought that um, for municipal vehicles with the, with the baby blue plates, there was a, probably a better solution out there than converting over and requiring us to have, a, you know, 250 transponders. And not that we have 250 vehicles going out of Austin, but essentially we're going to have to put a transponder in each town vehicle that the engineer's vehicle, the public works strategy vehicle that are going in and out of the city. And I, again, I don't want to make a, a short okay. story long, and David can fill you in on some of the well, but. I'll get the back story on that some other time. Okay. Thank you. So what, what the board did um, is sort of just take these one by one and then vote at the end of the night on Thursday, unless there are any that you guys want to pull out or you can vote as you go, whatever, you, I think it's whatever the will of the, the committee We've always voted them one at a time. Sure. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. I'll, I'll move the article. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Um, you should have received a memorandum this evening from the, from the finance director. Um, mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll sort of fly through this just briefly the uh, this is each each year you know as we as we sort of look toward the end of the fiscal year we, we often have accounts that need to have transfers so we, we vote our budgets um, by department at town meeting we have a we have a vote on salaries and a vote on operating um, and if there's an if we go in excess of either of those categories you have to do a transfer so um, we, we put this within the special town meeting so that we can move money uh, from department so that we can close the year um, in the black in each department um, many of these relate to the topic we discussed throughout the budget, which is uh, small adjustments for comp and class, where, you know, 18 months ago as we were putting together the 19 budget, we didn't know what the outcome of that was going to be. So based on the outcome of that, we have some, some transfers back and forth between operating budgets for the comp and class study. Um, we discussed the accounting uh, consulting assessment um, during the budget. Um, the, the project that the, I'll, I'll circle back to the top, but the project at the bottom, um, this was something that the board was, was pretty tuned into mid-year. We had uh, both of the uh, variable speed pumps at the, at the water treatment plant, which pushed the finished water out into the system, failed. Um, we have two pumps so that when one is down, the other can function. And um, we had sort of a perfect storm where um, one failed and then a week later the other one failed. So before we could replace them, we had to do an emergency purchase of water from Beverly. Uh, fortunately, you know, round the clock, uh, you know, work by the water department, really nobody noticed it. Um, but this is the cost of the emergency mid-year pump repairs. Um, I like to, you know, it, it, it's, it pleases me to point out that at our employee service awards this year, uh, uh, the, the rest of the employees in town selected this as the project of the year, as the one where the staff really kind of went above and beyond, um, where they were there around the clock getting, getting things back online. Um, but with this will require a transfer. Uh, within the water department uh, to cover that expense. Um, and then at the top, we did discuss during the budget process when we made the plan design changes a couple years ago to the health plan, expecting um, membership to decline. It actually went up, so we've been chasing this. We had to do a transfer at the last two town meetings to cover this. Uh, we, we think in the uh, budget that was approved, we've, we've covered most of that gap, and, and uh, hopefully through the plan design changes that we're talking about uh, currently with the IAC, We'll, we'll be able to we'll be able to resolve that moving forward, um, but we do require a budget transfer this year, and thankfully we had some retirements uh, and vacancies in the police department, so we're able to transfer that. So the good news is that there are no you know, free cash is not identified as, as any of the funding sources here, um, and uh, you know we think this is a pretty final list. But anything that you know Ronnie and his team are monitoring this sort of on a day to day basis. So between now and when we have the night of town meeting, there may be a couple of additional items that we need to add to this list. Point of order, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Town meeting members don't have the figure. What is the figure? The, the we, total? I don't know what we need. Breakout? We don't have that. Uh, no. There, Bill. Yeah. That's what I think he's referring to. Oh, sorry. That's okay. We were just down one, I think. They don't have a total on it. They don't have a total. Yeah, we wouldn't do a total, Bill, because it's by line item. Pardon? 
It's by line item, so we wouldn't do with the total. Okay. We can. That's to zero. They're just yeah. moving money between departments. There you go. <clears throat> we can. We'll, we'll bring copies to town meetings to have. Yep. So is it too? Is it too soon? It would seem, some, we don't need a vote on this. I was right going to say we this probably should wait till during, right. oh, during the meeting before the meeting. Done that. But these we are the ones identified so far. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Thank you. And third, third for our special town meeting um, is the state public works grant. This is our this is our chapter ninety funding. Uh, this is formula based. Um, we don't know how the form we don't know how the sausage gets made, but our number it's the same appropriation as last year, two hundred million, and our number's down slightly from I think around nine oh eight last year. Um, if you ask me to explain why that is, I wouldn't be able to. But the number our our number comes out to eight, just under eight hundred ninety five thousand dollars this year. Um, this is in our this is a point of argument each year with the MMA and the legislature. Um, Bill Bates is here tonight as a town meeting member, not as a uh, employee at the legislature, but our our concern is always that if we could get a multi-year uh, bond bill for Chapter 90, it would allow us to plan out some of our bigger projects because when it's, when it's year to year, it makes it difficult to do that. Um, and the MMA, of course, has been fighting you know, for a $300 million number here for many years, but 200 seems to be the number. And um, the vote um, on May 20th will allow uh, David Lane and the Streets Division to start their um, road work ahead of July 1st, which is why it's, why it's key to get that vote in May. <coughs> Any questions on the uh, Chapter 90 article? I'll move the article. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? On to the election of officers. We actually have one of our officers in the room tonight. We have Rich Maloney, who is our uh, measurer of wood and bark, and our and weigher of the weigher of coal. And he's our weigher of coal. Well, you can't view any fences. Yeah, you can't view fences. <laughs> Not qualified. You also have a river committee. That's I. You beat me to it. I have the sheet in front of me. I don't think we distributed this, but I'm, I will read the names of the officers that we have. Um, Wait uh, a minute. That's always one of the suspenseful things. Okay, then I'll hold yeah. off. Yeah, yeah, please. Thank, Thank you. you. We hold our breath. I, every year, I each hope that I'm named okay. as a field driver. Okay. Then, <laughs> with, given that, I will. Uh, Jeez, give away the plot. As a member of the finance you? committee, you are uh, strict by, by uh, can, count charter. You I cannot. cannot be the field driver. You cannot be the field driver. Oh, that's a tough choice. <laughs> okay. Well. Uh, if you'd like to vote blind on this one, you can have all the suspense. <laughs> we have great time. faith in your ability. We to do pick have the right candidates people. for each and every one of these important offices. So what have we done in the past? I don't, I don't think we vote on this one. Okay, well then this will go straight to them. Yeah. yeah. That sounds good to me. Yeah. <laughs> and um, likewise, you've already voted on the first three of the uh, articles two, three, and four here for annual town meeting. Actually, we did not vote on Article Four. Okay. Did we do three? We, we did. I think uh, as a. Um, a strategical misstep. We, I think we normally do it tonight, but we happened to do it last week. Uh, but we did not vote on Article 4. Well, then we ought to do that. Yeah. So, which is on page 4 of our warrant books. And I double checked it is the same number that we were presented that night. Yep. I think we've already had some lengthy discussion on the subject, unless anyone has anything else they'd like to share. Is there a motion? I move, move the, the article. article. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. <coughs> so the only other article uh, that requires a uh, sort of ceremonial vote on this page is, is the uh, annual report at the bottom of the screen. And uh, it is the Nile D Award winning <laughs> annual report. We've been, we've been submitting our revamped report to MMA each year uh, to, to, to see if we can get the best report uh, award and this year we did so uh, forevermore we will refer to it as the award-winning report uh, but that was distributed to town meeting members back in January are we skipping five six and seven yeah, yeah are we skipping five six and seven we'll come back to those oh this is strategic okay I couldn't fit the table I want on the next slide on this slide so I just moved them around a little bit where which one are you on uh, so we're article eight is the uh, committee reports so the report okay. I move that we accept the reports Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Unanimous. Now we're on to five, six, and seven. 
Uh, okay. so Joe Collins is not here tonight, um, but Article 5 is the vote each year that authorizes the treasurer collector to collect the property taxes and to use the tools afforded to him or her uh, under N MGL to do so. Any questions? I Sally. Have a question. Um, in the verbiage, it talks about um, giving the tax collector the ability to use several tools. Um, and among those is foreclosures. And I'm wondering um, how much leeway there is in using that. A lot. Okay. Very infrequent that we would, we would get there. Joe, Joe, Joe's staff does a really nice job of working with delinquent taxpayers. So we, we often have a, quite a bit of correspondence before we even go so far as putting a lien on a property. Um, and, and Joe and his staff are very good at establishing payment plans for folks. Um, I think I can recall one instance in the last couple of years where we had initiated a foreclosure process, but it was avoided uh, before it got to that point. Good, good yeah. to know. Thank yeah. you. <coughs> Any other questions? I'll move, move the up. article. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Mr. Collins is thrilled. Well, his job would have been a lot easier next year had you not allowed yeah. him to collect taxes. <laughs> um, Article 6 and 7, I'm, this is my chance to stop talking for a minute. Um, we have uh, Chief Assessor Steve Poole is here. Yeah, for one minute. Um, uh, so in January when we were talking about Smith School financing and, um, you know, the potential of a debt exclusion, uh, Selectman Bennett asked, you know, kind of when was the last time we evaluated our uh, tax abatement and uh, tax exemption programs for seniors and, and folks in town? Um, so the, the board had asked that we prepare articles to, to have that conversation, um, and that's what Articles Six and Seven are. And with that, I'll allow Steve to walk through uh, what would what would be what is proposed in these two articles. All right. Um, most of you are aware that um, uh, Chapter Fifty Nine allows for several exemptions uh, under the law for certain qualifying individuals, whether it be blind, veterans, or, or the elderly. Um, so if in it also section uh, five C and a half allows uh, you to amend the clauses, uh, the exemption amount that, that is specified under each clause. So currently it allows you basically to go take the base exemption of, of each um, clause and increase it from zero to 100 percent. Currently Darius is at 50 percent. So we take the base amount. For example, it's a veterans four hundred dollars and they get six hundred dollars. Um, this article here is proposing to the going to the full 100%, so it would effectively double the base amount. And that's, if you have any questions on that, I can answer them. I don't know if you want to vote on six and then go to seven, or I can get, I can talk we'll about seven now. Okay. Any questions? Oh, just oh. To, to add to it, uh, it would be an increase in cost. It, it's, you can't. The exemption, if you do increase the exemption, you can't reduce the amount of taxes. You can't pay less taxes this year than you would have paid last year. So okay. if they, and so, it, but over a, over a number of years, three or four years, it would eventually cost down probably about $80,000 additional to sure. for these exemptions. What, what are the typical criteria for somebody to qualify under Chapter 59? For which for a senior, I, I mean, I, I guess seniors is that the biggest? Yeah, is that senior, the biggest? senior is the largest. Yeah, yeah the senior has the the, the, uh, the large participation and in, in the in the highest um, exemption. Um, so it would be sixty five. Would statute is seventy years of older. Local option we've chose to go to sixty five years uh, and older. So you have to be sixty five years and older, and then including your social security uh, income. Your total income can't exceed thirty-three thousand dollars if you are single, and fifty thousand dollars if you're married. So the, the income levels are relatively low, but there, that we have no flexibility in those. It's not prorated, so you don't get the full amount at fifty. But if you're seventy-five, you get a percentage of it. Nope. No, it's sixty-five, and that's it. And it, it's not on the screen, but it's in the warrant for those who don't have a warrant. We have 240 taxpayers who take advantage of this program currently. Yeah. And this, this, that number wouldn't change necessarily by this vote. The benefit size would change, not necessarily the number of qualifying residents. How many do you anticipate in the next couple of years? Oh, how high is that 240 figure going to? 
Any idea? Uh, we're really, well, we're not changing any of the qualifications, so we don't see any increase in participation related to this because it doesn't, we can't make any more money to get it, you know, if we were able to go to $50,000 for a single applicant to qualify for their income, then we would predict a large increase. But we don't, we don't see, we've been pretty flat over the past 10 years that I've looked at with the participation, and we don't see a, a big change due to this. And I think, Mike, what you're at, the, the size of the benefit probably won't impact the number of golfers, but you might be asking over the next few years, what, what do we anticipate the number growing to? But we know when Pam Parkinson was here for her budget presentation, we talked about I think the senior population in town is up at least 10 percent in the last 10 years, probably closer to 15 percent. Um, and that's, you know, as the boomers age into retirement, uh, we, we may see an uptick in the number who, of seniors who qualify for this. Um, but we've seen that increase in senior population already, and as Mr. Poole has indicated, we haven't seen a correlated increase in the number of qualifying uh, seniors. That may be in part um, awareness of the program. It could be that a higher benefit will suddenly it'll, it'll be more attractive to people to, to apply and, and go through the process. Mm -hmm. Is is the the benefit is binary? So if your property tax bill is two thousand and one dollars and you're a senior, you get you you could and you phase into you know four or five years out, your your bill would go down to one dollar. It's not a proportional to the right, you know. but you can't obviously negate the entire bill. Right, but as long as you're positive. Any other questions? Is there a motion? Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry, Bill. Bill Bates Town Meeting Member Precinct 4. Um, I just wanted to get clarification. When you have exemptions for taxes, um, how does the town make that money up? Isn't that put on to the other taxpayers? Do you want to take that, Steve? What's that? Th those questions, how do you fund this program? Who pays, who pays for this program? You say it's going to cost 80000 How do we make that money up? We pay for it through, well, we appropriate the funds that goes into the overlay account, and then we, we once, once we go through due to the third quarter, which is the deadline, we see how much, and then we, we, we see how many uh, exemptions we granted, and then it gets funded through the overlay account. It's a shift. So the, the, the collective taxpayers' money gets moved into the overlay account, we all pay taxes, we pay into the overlay account, and then once the applications are received and approved, the money comes out of the overlay account to, to provide those benefits. Definitely, and I'm in full support of this. However, I do have a little bit of a problem with the verbiage that it says cost the town an additional $80,000, because I think it's important that people know whenever we give out a tax, ex tax exemption, the other taxpayers pick that up. It's not the town, it's the taxpayers. And I just have a little problem with that verbiage. I wish you'd reconsider that. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Any other questions? Are there any thoughts to raising the, the elderly age to 70 to line up with the state? Is there what? Is there any thoughts? Have there been any, been any discussions about raising the age limit? <clears throat> no. Well, I mean, the, we locally uh, optioned, I think, back in 2001 to reduce it from 70 to 65, and we've had no discussions that I'm aware of to raise it back to the 70. And so you can't be lowered beyond 65? No. So the, the prior time many did vote to lower that from 70 to 65. Anything else? Is there a motion? Move the uh, question. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Great. Article 7. In Article 7. Uh, Similarly to Article 6, this is another, um, this would actually, this is considered an abatement. And this is a program will, where it allows qualifying seniors to work uh, in town hall or somewhere for the town uh, for minimum wage and essentially work off a portion of their tax bill. Currently, the maximum abatement that they can earn is $500. The law allows us to go to $1,500. Uh, so that's essentially what this article is proposing, that we go from $500 to $1,500. And, you know, the piece of that is, is once you go over, I believe it's $600, you have to, the town has to um, issue a 1099 to the individual. Right. Um, that the state doesn't see it, the state doesn't recognize it as income, the federal government does, so it will be on your federal tax returns. 
uh, it's something that, that uh, the senior who, who is doing this work off program should be reporting anyways, but generally I don't think anybody really does. Uh, but once you once you exceed that threshold, <coughs> it will be getting a 1099, so that's something to consider. Okay. Questions, Paul? No. I, Gina? I'm oh, sorry. Um, it says we have 15 to 20 seniors that do this. Who coordinates what kinds of um, things they do to work off? Um, generally, generally it's the same group of folks every year, plus or minus two or three. And uh, Pamela and, and our office and the assessor's office works to coordinate with the needs of departments all across town. Uh, usually a department will have a couple of people that, that they like and get along with, and it'll be the same people that go back in, each, in that department every year. But we do have some shift and, and some movement around, but she works closely with the different department division heads and make, make sure that there's coverage. Ted? So do you, you see, do you envision it being sort of the same two dozen people just working for the same departments a little a little more? I mean, is it going to be time well, time well spent from the town's perspective? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, we could certainly use them to the full extent of those hours uh, to, to the extent other, other departments could. I'm not, I'm not sure, but I think generally the program is well received by the different departments in this. We always have stuff going on and projects that, that they can work on. And actually, sometimes the lower hours can be limiting because if you get them involved in a big project, they run out of hours, run out of hours halfway through, and uh, you know, then you're kind of picking up the pieces where they left off. There's also the, I think there's the, it's, it, there's not an economic benefit, but there's an added benefit to having sort of interaction between seniors and staff. It's nice to have them spend some time in town hall and get to know employees. I think that pays dividends as well. Yeah, I mean, my department used them for three years, and they really help us out with the, you know, all our stuff is uh, we deal with a lot, we have a lot of files for every property in town, and they just get clogged up. So we've had them help us just do some, <laughs> you know, nitty gritty mm -hmm. work in our yeah. file system to help us out clean it out. So it's been good for us. Oh, Mike? Yeah, none of these people in Article 7 double dip with Article 6, do they? Oh, well, yeah, you can qualify for both. The, you can't get two, two uh, exemptions out of, under the clauses, but where the abatement program is different than uh, an exemption under the clauses, uh, you can get both, as long as you meet the income So the same person could get double benefits? Yes, yep. Because it's not an exemption, you work, you know, you're essentially working for the money. It's not a straight tax exemption, which it would be under the, the clauses. Mike, any questions? Nothing. Sally, one? I have none, thank you. Sally, two. <laughs> um, when did this program go into effect? Oh, I don't know. It, it's, it's been around for... Forever? Yeah, for, okay. a very, for a very, very long time. Ten or, okay. And how... Um, how is it, how do people know that they can take part? Uh, we work closely with the senior center and then, uh, you know, generally we coordinate with the collector's office and make sure that they have some pamphlets down there and then any seniors or anybody looking for any assistance, they send them to the assessor's office and basically it's, you know, it's just a lot of word of mouth. We have information on our website. If you walk down to the front counter there, that we have front center of the trifold section of this right here. You can take one, it's got all the information here with the income levels and things like that. And uh, you just mentioned income level. Yep. There is a, so there's a income threshold yep. for this, but not for the other? No, there's income threshold for the, for the uh, 41C, the elderly, is that what you're talking about? Uh, for Article 6 and 7? Yeah, there's income thresholds for both, yep. Okay. And John, just for, you know, 41C is a little bit more restrictive. It's $33,000, for example, for a single person, and the senior work off program is uh, $50,000 for that same senior, senior, for that same person. Okay, thanks. Yep. Um, will there be a potential for seniors? Uh, to continue working to, uh, to that $599 level uh, if they so choose? Or um, are you only going to be looking for uh, seniors who can maybe do 
extended hours. I'm uh, sure if they wanted to stay under the $600 threshold, we could accommodate yeah. that. Sure. Yeah. That's actually not something I've really thought through, but I don't see why we couldn't. Yeah. Any audience questions, Bill? I'm sorry, um, Bill Bradstreet. No, 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 no. Mine's quick, I promise. Mine's, I just want to say, uh, oh, in, a, in my other role, job, I have to deal with seniors a lot that go through the assessing department. And I want to con congratulate you. Your assessing department, they are so helpful. That folder alone that's up on the counter, it just explains everything in layman's terms. And Pam and a couple other people in there, when you need them, they, they have the answers and they're just very responsive. So congratulations. Thank you. I just realized between Bill, Sally, and Mike, you've got a third of the room covered tonight. Yes. So that's very convenient for the chair. You can't swing a cat without hitting that or a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> Bill Bradstreet, town meeting member, precinct one. I believe almost everyone in town gets an electric bill. Would it be possible? Because some people don't even come to town hall. Yeah. They pay their bills. They're not aware of what you're talking about. But we all get an electric bill. Can you, the notice that gets sent with that, could a paragraph be added to that so that everyone would know that? And then if they choose to ignore it, that's fine. But at least should make the effort to have more of the town people involved uh, possible? We can certainly look into that. We we'll use the real tax estate bills tax bills. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> we we'll use the center body and the real estate yeah. tax bills to do different notices or something like Just that. Just so it's be. out there so yeah. people as yeah, you absolutely. said, yep. they don't have to come to town hall to look and see what can I do. It's presented to them. Thank you. Particularly in the year where the programs are changing, I think that actually makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Any other questions? Move the article. Is there a second? Second. second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Great. Okay. Moving on to uh, Article 10. <clears throat> Our Director of Inspectional Services, Rich Maloney, is here for, uh, because my break will end after Rich is done, but well, I turn the floor over to Rich. I brought my own point. Oh. Or Thursday. Red. You do have dueling lasers, yeah. Rich. I love that. <laughs> All right, so um, I think I explained to the selectmen that this happens about every six years. We uh, kind of look at our fees. We do a survey, and we surveyed... Uh, all the towns around us, and then we pick towns uh, similar demographics as Danvers, commercial, residential mix, population. And uh, what we came up with was that our residential fee was uh, almost $3 less than the average, and our commercial fee was $2 less than the average. So we proposed to raise the building permit fees, um, the residential new construction only from 10 to $12 per thousand cost of construction, and the commercial fee from 12 to 14 dollars per thousand cost of construction that's article 10. and the point of emphasis rich made with the board was that the the fees for renovations or you know improvements to homes would not see an increase this is for new construction on the commercial and residential side are the um are we in line on average with uh in terms of uh, not new construction but renovations and so forth uh, that varies widely, okay. so we just we feel like um, yeah, just, just because it covers everything, roof, siding, we really don't want to penalize people that really have to do a project. Sure. Um, so we feel it's a prudent prudent approach is we can look at the uh, remodel fee on the residential side uh, yeah. in the future. Sure. Sally? Any questions? I'm good, thank you. Okay. Sally? None for me either, thanks. Mike? Nope. Mike? Yeah, was there any question on the raising, uh, to raising the minimum fee from 25 to, say, 50? Minimum well, again, fee seems kind of small, low it, for this it, time, it, time of the, you know, 2000. It, again, the minimum fee really applies to um, remodels. So yeah. it's really, again, it's really trying to uh, not penalize people that have to fix their steps, fix their porch, patch their roof. It, you know, we want to promote people getting the permits, and the problem is if you... If you raise them, people aren't gonna people aren't gonna pull permits. And we, we're hearing these stories from other towns where, like water feed water heaters, some towns are charging over hundred dollars to change a water heater. Well, guess what? People aren't pulling permits now. We have yep. gas leak issues. So again, we keep what we feel is very important uh, some minimum fees at low levels just to uh, promote getting the permits and getting inspected. 
Okay. Thank you. Ted, welcome. Uh, I don't think I have it. Gene? Paul? I'm all set. You know, I guess my question is, would it behoove us, instead of always aiming for the, you know, we can do this every so many years and hit the middle of the pack, you know, want to be right in the middle, don't, not be noticed, would it be sometimes beneficial to say, instead of going up from, uh, from 10 to 12, do we, you know, do we want to go up to 13, uh, you know, uh, and be a little bit ahead so that, uh, you know, what are we going to lose? Uh, especially, you know, when you see a big development come into town, why are we, uh, why are we just hiding in the middle? So you want to talk in three years instead? Yeah. <laughs> sure, yeah, that or, you know, or go up to 13. You know, what, uh, I mean, you know, I guess here's, here's the question. What are we making with that $2 approximately with that increase? What kind of money are we going to see? If, again, more, it's more on the commercial side. If um, the numbers were the same as this year, we projected about $80,000. Okay. So we could, you know, if we bumped it up to $13, we could see... Um, $120,000. No, less. If we, no, if we added another dollar. Yeah. Oh, you're, you're talking about the residential side. Residential or the commercial, either side. Yeah, I would say the, we the, added, you know, the, the new construction on residential, we, we average, I would not, not new houses, but we averaged about 23 to 24 new units a year, residential units. Uh, maybe half of those might be houses. So that's really where the new residential is. It's really the big bang for the buck here is in commercial construction. Oh, it's 12, they're going to 14. 14, so I'm sorry, yeah. 15. So 15 to 15. 15. Yeah, so I, I guess, I, you know, instead of going up $2 each, why don't we go up $3 each and make a little more money? Well, if you want to propose your own Warren article. <laughs> I guess, well, that, it's just, yeah, I mean, that's, know, that's, up to, that's up to you guys. I, I, you know, again, we just did an analysis. Uh, it just... It's weird that we did one in 2001, 2007, 2013, and um, usually when a new finance director comes in, he goes, so, how's our fees? <laughs> <laughs> when you mentioned increasing the recommendation, Rodney's getting very excited over here, I can tell. And if I can channel my inner rich for a while, too. I think, um, you know, the, the goal here isn't necessarily to try to maximize revenue. It's, I think, um, we don't want to get to a point where we're getting grumbling from developers that, that our fees are the highest. I mean, that's obvious. And I think to your point, there's whether it's hiding in the middle or, or being at the mean. I think yeah. Rich's goal is to try to <coughs> increase it based on what the market dictates, but we never want to lead the market. But I think um, that said, going from 14 to 15 is certainly not going to be leading the market. Right. I, I, I guess that's my point is, yeah. you know, we could make a decent amount more money while still not, you know, leading the market. That's well, maybe the follow-up question is, does it take a lot of effort to do a survey every three years instead of every five years? True. No, it's... Everybody's on the uh, web, so you can yeah. go to the, all the town websites and city town city websites, and just uh, so it's not that difficult. But I agree we, with Steve that we do want commercial businesses to want to come to Danvers and fill our. Oh, absolutely, park. absolutely. But I don't think a dollar is going to make you know it's you know it, it's not going to make a difference. But it'll, you know that could pay a salary. So um, I think we're saying. I mean, I think the richest point. Um, we wouldn't want to see the. We would not be recommending the commercial fee go to thirty dollars. No, no. Thousand because then we're going to be disincentivizing development. Um, and so for the same reason that he wouldn't want to see a hundred dollar inspection fee on a water heater, we wouldn't want to. We wouldn't want to be leading the market on commercial. No. But what you're describing is. We're not, not talking about leading the market. We're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. I think we're. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to speak for Rich, but I think that that's a reasonable. I think we'd be comfortable there. Do we give? Sorry. To no. Go ahead. Speak out of turn. Do we give any other tax incentives for new businesses to come? No, no. We did, that has not generally been part of the okay. toolkit. My personal view is that that's not a great tool. I think we um, we tend to we tend to do the, our best work when we're offering you know incredibly efficient regulatory processes for people. Um, the fact that we have our own electric and we can sit at the table with them and have all the utilities represented and give them what they need, uh, we we beat I think we beat the competition on service and not tax right. breaks, which has been it's a long-standing policy, and I certainly I wholeheartedly support that approach. That's, that's not to say we wouldn't or couldn't for the right project. We have, in fact, done, we did one tax increment financing project maybe 10 years ago for self-signaling, mm -hmm. um, which was a joint effort between Danvers and Beverly. Mm -hmm. um, but historically, we haven't needed to, to roll out tools like that to be competitive. 
Any audience questions? Bill Nicholson. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Bill Nicholson, Precinct 8, Tommy, you remember? Uh, this will save a trip to your office, Mr. Building Inspector. What's that? Oh, yeah. How do you treat a room that's destroyed because of a fire? How do I treat it? Yeah. Water? <laughs> well, you got to rebuild it, right? Yeah. So, so that's a re you, that's a remodel. Yeah. And what would the charge be on that? Well, it'd be based on the cost of con the estimated cost of repair. So we our minimum is twenty five. So it's usually uh, if it's eight dollars per thousand on the remodel, so eight th so up to three thousand dollars is the minimum fee. Okay. I'll be in to see him. <laughs> You've been playing with matches, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions from the audience? Move Article 10. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Please. On to 11. Just to be clear, that was moved as presented? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. We didn't. We won't go six years next Just time. making sure. That's all. <laughs> I thought about amending it. But. Okay. Article 11 is... Um, we have, there's a table in the building code that requires us to do annual inspections, biannual inspections, uh, every five years, two years, it all depends what the use is. Um, so we have that, we adopted that table out of the building code in 1990 and put it in our general bylaw and used that fee structure out of the building code. Uh, that was, 1990 was between the fourth and fifth edition of the building code. We're in the ninth edition. Um, the people who, um, published the code have changed from when that was, so the language has changed, the use groups have changed. So we need to get rid of the old table with a bunch of footnotes that don't refer to anything and uh, adopt the new table. It went from 108 to 110. Um, and we changed a couple of the fees in that table and create, created a new one. So, um, so what we did is we broke down the e-use group, which we're required to inspect. So this is the STEM building at the prep. As you can see, that's five stories. We have to walk that whole building, stair towers, electric room, and um, check all the egresses, make sure it's good. So that one was at $50, the e-use groups. Um, we bumped that up to 100. We feel that's prudent. And then the daycares were included in the e-use group, and what we did is we broke those out as a separate a daycare e-use group in the table and just left that at $50 because most of the daycares in town are mom and pop operations, and we really don't want to group them in with the, the bigger buildings and penalize them. Sure. So we did there. And then um, we kind of did the same thing with the multifamily. So this is uh, 180 Newberry Street, the old swing away. Mm -hmm. uh, it kind of looks, you know, it's probably the same amount of work as the prep building. It's five stories on the ground park and at this particular one. Same thing, we gotta walk the whole building. Common areas, we don't go into the units and we don't go into the classrooms. Common areas, stair towers, check the elevator, electric rooms. And then we have small, we we'll call mom and papa, maybe this is a three family that three people own. We're required to you know, check the common areas only. So this has a common stair tower in the front and the back. So again, we left the small, four families and less, we left it $50 in the over four, we went up to $100, mm -hmm. so and again, just, just to clarify, for, so for the, for the Andover Street example, you have five or six buildings there, those would be five or six separate inspections, is that right? Each building's a, a fee, right, right? and then right. we do, like, 180 has six buildings plus the pool house, so that's a, you know, we do it as a campus, we're going to go, we're going to get the facilities manager, we're going to walk all the buildings the same day, and they owe us $700, and there's usually some follow-up that nobody's ever 100%. Um, same thing with the prep is there's multiple buildings out there we do. We set up a one or two day inspection with the facilities manager, go through all the buildings. And Good. So that's it. Paul, any questions? I'm also. Gina? Ted? Nope. Mike? No questions. Mike? No. Nope. Sally? No questions, Sally? thanks. <laughs> just one. Uh, it, this certainly seems reasonable. I'm just curious. Do you, do you base it on how much time someone has to spend 
at a particular property versus well, there's, how many uh, electrical or, in other words, is it just, it's time on task? It, yeah, the, the, the building code originally had a recommended fee schedule. So we kind of followed that. We bumped it up a little bit. Uh, you can really charge what you want, but so we can do, you know, so we're going to get $700 when we go out <coughs> to 180 Newberry Street. Um, so yeah, we can get that done, get through those buildings in, in half a day, one guy. So it's a reasonable okay. fee. And there's probably a follow-up. There might be a couple things amiss, and we got to go back, double-check. And then we have to, you know, we keep a permanent record, and we issue a certificate of inspection every year. So, uh, yeah, I think the fee is reasonable no, so, for the amount of work we do. Right. No, but I'm asking, are you calculating it based on how much time someone has to be out there versus how much you'll get because of the number of units? We don't use the number of units. No, it, it's, it's based on what we feel is is... Again, that building, you could get through the common areas, stair towers, um, be able to walk through that in an hour, one building. So we send a, send a notice out, you're up for inspection. So they send yep. the fee in, we go out, we do the inspection. If everything's good, we can go back, we type up the certificate of inspection. In this particular building, it's once every five years. Schools, once every year. Daycares, once every year. Churches, sanctuaries are once every five years. Places of assembly, um, movie theaters, we got to go in every year. Um, restaurants that sell liquor, we have to go in every year. Okay. So there's a range of um, time frames. Okay. But yeah, we feel, we feel the fees cover what we have to do. Okay. okay. We do about 200 inspections a year. Okay, thanks. Yep. Any questions from the audience? Is there a motion? Move the article. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. You guys don't need me anymore? No. <laughs> you want my, clip? You want my uh, pointer? We, I, I like the green one better. <laughs> Thank you. All right, everybody have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Denim? Have you heard about the denim? No. Yeah. Article 12. Article 12 is our technology plan. This is an annual article. Um, the uh, Colby Cousins, our technology director, could not be here tonight, so I will do my best impression of an <coughs> IT director, which will be a pretty lousy impression, I will <coughs> acknowledge up front. Um, but I'll describe the process first. So each year during the budget process, um, Colby and his team collect um, requests or ideas or you know, needs from each of the departments, including the electric division, the schools, the town, you know, general government, public safety, um, and those requests uh, are reviewed sort of uh, in, in, in whole because IT is one area where you really do get uh, economy of scale when you, when you bulk purchase. Um, so, you know, Colby and Keith Derverna and uh, Jeff Lieberman from the schools have really <coughs> achieved some great savings in the last couple of years by working together. Um, and so, you know, Colby and his team vet those requests and, and prioritize and come back with recommendations. Uh, we spent $402,000 or so last year uh, on our tech plan, so we're, we're about 340 this year. Um, it's down a little bit based on all the things we talked about at the beginning of the evening. Um, I'll point out this is the first of three articles where we can talk briefly about prior year savings. Um, so we have three articles, technology plan, buildings improvement uh, <coughs> article, and grounds improvement article, where um, rather than voting on standalone projects, uh, we bundle those projects, so we, we may vote on a single number for buildings improvements, but there may be 15 projects included in there. Um, so over time, projects are completed. Some of those projects are completed under budget. Um, at the back of your warrant, uh, you'll see a, a fund balance snapshot uh, as of March 31st of each year. Um, so this was a year where we worked with Colby and David Lane um, to see if there were prior year savings that could be reallocated to cover some of the current costs. So this is a case where um, you know, there, we, we were looking at each of the previously approved projects, those were the, those were those that were completed, and we had about $200,000 in the tech plan that had accumulated. Um, so the proposal here is to take about half of what's available and essentially reserve for unanticipated need in the IT um, and, and use it to cover some of the, the current costs. So that'll still leave uh, Colby and his team with what he feels is a, is a comfortable uh, sort of balance in, in, in the event that machines fail mid-year, things like that. So. So the $340,000 proposal is a combination of 240 from free cash 
and then 98 that we'd be reallocating from previous uh, votes of town meeting. Um, and we break the request out into sort of three uh, governmental service areas. We have the school request, the library request, and then the general government request. Um, the iMac desktops, um, uh, the schools, a, it's a Mac, they use Chromebooks for the students, but the, the administrative offices and the teachers are on Mac, so this is, this is uh, part of the technology replacement plan that Jeff Lieberman uh, maintains for the schools. Um, if you ask me to get much deeper on that, I won't be able to. Uh, the second one for the schools, um, we've, you know, we're in the midst of doing a, a pretty comprehensive fiber uh, optic infrastructure project across the town. Um, as part of that, uh, we'll talk about on this article and the next article, we've been um, consolidating our data uh, closets. So we have a, we have a pretty state-of-the-art data center at Borough Street, which is where all of our uh, servers and virtual servers um, exist. And uh, we're moving toward um, having our backup, which is the next article at the high school. So we'll have redundancy within our own system, which is, which is a pretty um, prudent move as an organization. Um, but the switches as, that are re related to our network um, need to be replaced periodically. The middle school's network switches are the oldest in our system. Um, this $38,000 is about half of the cost. Uh, we qualify for E-rate through the schools, and so Colby and uh, <coughs> Keith and Jeff have worked that we were able to uh, capture some E-rate uh, dollars that are, that are available um, to supplement this cost. Uh, on the library side, it's... Um, a lot of routine, you know, it's replacement of some of the um, uh, equipment that's used by staff and patrons, um, you know, printers that are getting wear and tear. Um, we recall a uh, 3D printer was purchased for the library last year. Um, I, I can't remember whether Alex brought any of the uh, show and tell products to the finance committee, but he did bring some objects to the board of selectmen's meeting that were printed on that. I believe there was a squid. Um, I believe there was another animal, but I can't remember which. But um, it, it's not all fun and games. They're doing some pretty interesting things with this stuff. And so um, we, we do recall Alex talking during the budget process about sort of re taking, in a, taking an unused storage room in the basement of the library mm -hmm. and repurposing that into an education space. Um, so they're using technology and sort of available space to, to grow their um, services there. Uh, first couple here are, you know, the routine. We have, you know, we have a schedule that we maintain, and that that changes based on, you know, what's happening from year to year. But fire and senior center and civil engineering are up this year for some uh, equipment replacement. Um, we are going to be moving, you know, systematically. We've been upgrading the town's phone system to voice over internet. So next on the list is the public works facility. Um, down at the bottom, uh, we're on Office 365 and doing a lot of cloud-based um, work for, for data and files, so this is our annual licensing <coughs> for that. Um, this is part of that uh, upgrades that we, we don't know about yet, but in six months are going to hit us, and so there needs to be some funding in place to keep the system functional. And then um, this is on the town side, some of the network switching equipment upgrades that need to be made, um, in part as, as a result of the as a result of fiber project. So. Um, that I'd be, I'd be happy to fumble through any questions that you may have about the tech plan. We all have a bunch of technical questions. Excellent. So, Sally first. Um, I'm sure that these are all essential items, particularly at the schools. Um, although, is it a three-year replacement? Are they assuming that after three years they need to replace laptops? Or five years? I don't think it's three years. Okay. Five years sounds more as a schedule. That I, I we often have a schedule that says, them. sorry, they rotate them. Some right, but I think middle school, I think. Okay. But I think to the, I, I guess to the, the point I, I mean, we probably have a five-year schedule. And we may get six or seven years out of. Okay. And that's that's okay, typically good. the case here. Okay. Uh, we won't replace it just when it says if right. the schedule says replace. We're going to evaluate the machine before we. I figured. Replace. Okay, yeah. good. Now, I'm just noticing, I can't help but notice, so $5,400 for some desktops and laptops at the Senior Center, which is close to what we're spending at the library. <coughs> Are there enough for the library? I mean... Well, we have laptops and desktops, so there's 10,000 combined. 
one of the points that Alex made during the budget presentation was that um, they are trying to shift a little bit from the desktops that permanently occupy space to more of a laptop model that can be checked out so that that space can be used in the, in the meantime for other things that people can take the lap, laptop or the tablet and move around the library. So okay. this is based on what was requested by, by the library. Okay, got it. Okay. I'm good. Thank you. Sally. Thank you. When you talk about prior year savings, I mean, isn't that a um, transfer within the budget? I mean, it doesn't require a different type of vote? We can't. So the, when the money is set aside in a warrant, it essentially is a capital account. It just sits there. It can be re it could be appropriated out of that to free cash, um, but in this case, the short answer is yes. The, the town meeting needs to vote on that, mm -hmm. but this is the process by which they would do that. So it's different in warrant articles than in a departmental budget, where if a department doesn't spend all that was budgeted, it flows directly to free cash. But it's a lapsing account. But in the in the warrant article, it doesn't happen automatically. It's a non-lapsing account. It would stay there until it was acted upon. And as a result, you're allowed to carry it into the next year. And that's so. If you look at the back of the warrant, we do report each year what the current. Uh, yeah, I saw I saw that chart. I just yeah. wasn't sure of the of the mechanism yeah. for. Okay, that make thank you. I understand now. Mike, no, Mike. Um, since there's nobody here from the school department, I don't think uh, I'll have to ask you. Did you say that the IMAX? For the school department are going to be de desktops. Are those for the teachers? Or who are those? <laughs> this, this could be for um, administrative office staff, counselors, um, the curriculum team. It could be for for teachers, uh, you know, desks, things like that. They they, they have Macs throughout the the uh, schools for the teachers and administrative staff. All right, because there's no uh, uh, what do they call them? The pit. The the ones that the kids use. Chromebooks. The Chromebooks. Mm -hmm. the Chromebooks yeah. Yeah. Not this year, no. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's all. Ted? No questions. Gina? Just quick on the library supplies, why would that be in the warrant and not necessarily in the, the ongoing annual budget? I would assume it's small dollars, but are these one-time purchases? Yeah, we, I'd have to, we'd have to dig for the backup on that, but we do, you know, systematically, we try to move things. Historically, this warrant has been used to introduce something new and then we move it into the operating. Okay. So, you know, we're still rolling out the Office 365. Eventually that annual licensing needs to move into the operating budget because that's not an expense that's going to go away. Um, but that's, we're still at the beginning of that and I think you know, we, we haven't had a technical supply line in the tech warrant for the library before so my, my guess is it's related to some of the technology that they've been rolling out. But that wouldn't be there next year. Okay, good point on the Office 365. Thank you. Paul? Oh, sorry. Any questions from the audience? Move the article. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Article 13. Article 13 is uh, disaster recovery, and I have the assistant manager and finance director are encouraging me not to use the useful analogy that I was thinking about earlier today for this. We talk about security fabric, and I wanted to talk about spandex and denim and all the things we're using to protect the critical infrastructure, but I'm, I'm going to avoid that, and instead I'm going to talk about what's on the screen. Thank uh, you. You're welcome. Uh, this, so this is this is a project that Colby and his team have been. Can we call it technical disaster recovery? By the way. Yes. I, every time I see disaster recovery, I'm expecting to see um, oh. the police and fire chief. Well, the, this could be necessitated by a real natural sure. oh, disaster. Oh, absolutely. Oh, absolutely. Yes, yeah. this would be to make sure that our critical systems and data are protected in the event of a, a disruption, whether that's man-made or cyber attack or you know, anything, hurricane or anything like that. But um, this is a, so the, the electric department is gearing up for a pretty uh, uh, robust audit next year of its security uh, fabric. And you know, they, the, the electric, because we operate an electric department, um, they, we have different uh, security requirements there than we do in other parts of the town government. Um, I think the benefit of that is that Colby and his team in gearing up for this audit and working with the electric staff have been making sure that we, uh, that we qualify you know, for the NERC SIP uh, uh, security across the organization. So the, the non-electric benefit uh, departments and, and technology are benefiting from falling under that umbrella. So electric is ahead of the rest of the town on this project, uh, but the proposal here is to uh, you know, do the town and the school portions of this project um, to ensure that we have, you know, 
proper disaster recovery and protection across the organization, you know, for, for police, library, schools, as, as well as electric. So, um, you know, this is, this is part of the project where, and I mentioned on the previous slide, um, we, have, we have essentially data closet. We have four sort of small data centers across town. Um, and we're migrating toward having two data centers, one at the high school, one at Borough Street, that are going to be pretty robust, cover, you know, connected with redundancy through fiber. Um, and so this, this is related to that build out of the high school data closet. Um, and uh, the, uh, that's about all I can say. So I can tell I'm, I'm starting to drift off. Um, and I apologize that Colby's not here to, to provide a much better explanation than that. But this is, this is the town and school side of a project that was initiated last year for electric and is gearing up to make sure that our security across the board is, is at the sort of the highest threshold. And, and similarly, um, I'll point that we had, um, uh, we had a, a $470,000 project approved at last year's town meeting to replace all of our radio public safety mm -hmm. radio infrastructure. Um, and you know, Colby worked closely with uh, Pat and Bob um, and they were able to, you know, they, they had a quote. So the, the project estimate to do that budget was $470,000. They were able to modify the scope and make some changes along the way. And they, they delivered the project for $400,000. So 70% of this project is proposed to be covered through the savings on last year's project. So it's 30% of the cost will come from free cash and 70% will come from the, the savings from last year's project. Okay. Thank you. Paul, any questions? I have no questions. Gina? Mm -hmm. Nope. Ted? Um, so this is, this isn't going to be an ongoing expenditure for debt disaster recovery. Tournament. This will be from, this will be, um, this won't be the one and only time. And then, this is a, we're doing a full blown refresh of the system right understood. now. Yeah. And all of our disaster recovery is located within damage though? That we don't have like. We don't contract out for that. So there's, no, so there's nothing like in, 500 miles away in case in Arizona something bad happens. Like that, yeah. You're right. Yeah. So we have, you know, between Borough Street and then over at the high school. Um, and I, you know, there's there's risk that if the whole town were wiped out, right, it right, would be in right. trouble. But okay. the probability of that, I think, the the cost benefit of having it, no contracts, able to manage it with our own technical staff. Yep. Mike, all set. Mike, all set. Sally, no questions. Thanks. Sally, I'm good. Any I'm gonna... questions from the audience? Move the move the article. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Great. Jumping ahead. <clears throat> Page 20, Article 36. Article 36 is an annual um, vote the town meeting needs to take to reestablish each of our revolving fund accounts in town. Um, the only change uh, from last year to this year uh, is a $20,000 uh, increase in the child care program, and that's really a function of two things. One, the minimum wage law uh, went into effect, and two, we're seeing increased enrollment. So this is for the after school program. Um, and summer program, and we just, uh, David and his team deliver a really quality service and more people want to participate. So um, for the newer members, this essentially, each year town meeting votes on the maximum amount that each of these departments can raise through revenue and expend out of that account. So um, this is saying that, you know, recreation is authorized to collect up to $640,000 in program fees and then spend that revenue on programming uh, that's offset by the revenue. Uh, and so the, the funding sources for these come from a variety of uh, places, as, as is noted in the warrant. Some of these are mostly funded through charitable giving and, and grants. Others are funded through program fees, so recreation, um, council on aging, those are two where program fees support uh, the, you know, the staff time and, and materials that are associated with services. Um, canine is mostly, you know, this our, the canine program is mostly funded through grants and, and, and uh, donations and things like that. So. Sorry? Oh, I still did, yeah. So um, we meant to correct this slide after the selectmen's uh, hearing. We did not. Um, any preservationists in the room, I would, I would uh, point out that that number should be $100,000, not $450,000. Uh, when we were dragging the numbers down the screen, obviously the, uh, the water use number was transposed on the preservation line. So that number should be $100,000, and it's correct in your warrant books. It's just incorrect on the slide. Thank you. Sally. I'm just a little bit curious about the um, and the water mitigation impact fees. Um, how we're how we how we stack up in terms of our water conservation efforts. If you were to compare us to 
surrounding communities? Do we have a measure for that? We we actually had a two-hour meeting today to talk about this very subject, and what you will find is that Danvers is uh, far and away leading the pack, in part because we've been held to different standards and restrictions and regulations than most water suppliers, in, in part because we collaborated 15 years ago instead of uh, choosing litigation as the most effective route to uh, establish a new permit. Um, so we're doing tremendous conservation, uh, and the, the water use mitigation program is not something you'll see in a lot of places. It's part of our permit requirement and the swimming regs that were passed a few years ago. Um, so when there's new development uh, in town, we are, we are required by the state to collect fees related to the, um, the, the water demand. And those fees are uh, appropriated into this fund. And then this fund is used to offset it. We use it to do our rebate programs for um, washing machine replacements, low flow, shower heads, toilet replacements. We also use it to offset um, capital expenses that are going to be related to water conservation. So as part of the high school uh, fields project, we were able to fund a retention tank um, underground that collects water that falls on the field, it flows into this tank, and we can use that to do some irrigation that doesn't require the water system. So um, it's not a bad program, but it, in answer to your original question, um, we're doing quite a bit more conservation than a lot of places. Good to do. know. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sal? Um, I, I mean, I'm familiar with, with all these accounts from years past, but I know that we have a big waterways, the dredging stuff coming up. And so I think the uh, waterways dredging improvement revolving fund account kind of leapt out, out to me. With $65,000, there's not a lot of dredging that they're going to be doing. So what, what, is that, what is that fund used for? <clears throat> Um, it's a lot of it is to do the preliminary work before we get to the dredging project. So a lot of the grants uh, that we would be applying for as part of that process require you to have some of the engineering work and, and survey work done ahead of time. So by by appropriating both here and we also have a standalone, a couple of standalone uh, warrant articles. Uh, one is um, well, it's a twenty thousand dollar annual appropriation in. You know we're able to do a lot of that legwork a year or two or three ahead of the of the actual project. This wouldn't necessarily. This wouldn't come close to covering the cost of the actual dredging yeah, project. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. So, so let's say at the end of the fiscal year, um, all the money hadn't been spent out of any of these accounts. So that that goes to free cash at that point. How it does stays that in the revolving account. But the, these numbers are the max that can be held in the revolving in account. In particular, it's the max they could spend in one year. The max. You could collect sixty thousand and spend zero, and then your starting balance next year would be sixty thousand. But for most of these accounts, you have programs. So, so for, rec for the child care program, for example, um, if they were collecting the fees and not offering um, the fun club, uh, we'd have a line around the block at town hall for, for sure. that. So for, so, so for most of these, it's money in, money out. But you could have some where it, it builds. And so how, how is that building balance accounted for within, within town records? Like, for instance, something like, as you, like you said, the child care stuff, that's very much um, uh, customer driven. Of course, families would object if, if, if those programs weren't available for them. But something more like this waterway dredging, um, if, if that builds up beyond the 65,000, what happens then? If what's in the revolving account builds up to more than 65,000, what happens? I mean, the short answer is nothing would happen. What's the balance? Do you know the balance? The waterway improvements has a balance of 35000 currently in the middle of the year. So it's really not a problem. The question I'm asking is not a realistic problem. I think, I think are you asking, Sally, excuse me, if there are any accounts that have a balance that exceeds those amounts? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Can you cite an example? Um, the Water Use Mitigation Fund has $1.2 million in it currently. So yes, to your question, if we built up a substantial balance, we may relook at how we utilize the fund and if there's other uses for the fund. But we can't just sweep it into free cash, for okay. example. And the, 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 the one program in particular is interesting because the, the revenue that we generate, we're, you know, we're obligated to collect that revenue based on the type of development. You know, we have a fee structure that's associated with the type of development we see. Um, but it, you know, this is this is a relatively new program that came out of the swimming regulations, and it's hard to spend the money to be to be candid. I mean, there are only so many low flow shower heads you can offer a rebate on, 
and only so many you know low low flow toilets you can replace. Um, so the, the the fund balance there has grown, and that's why even the I think even the DEP because this is a really this is a relatively novel program. There aren't mm -hmm. too many programs like this that the DEP can point to. So they they've been somewhat flexible with us in terms of how we, which is why the, I think the high school project and putting in the retention tank is not necessarily one that the DEP would have thought of ahead of time, but it occurred to us as part of the planning for that project that it would be a good use of the fund, and they agreed. Um, so it's, I mean, that's probably, that's the highest balance that you'll see on this list, and it's just over a million dollars. So that, that fund is based on state statute, so you could turn to... <coughs> not statute. It's not written into statute, but the, the so, one... Mm -hmm. program is a creature of DEP regulation. So, it's so you could turn to DEP anyway to say, this is how we would like to use this money. But some, but the, some of the other revolving fund accounts, I, I don't, are all of them somehow linked? I guess they're all based on regulatory schemes, they're aren't they? They're pretty much all tied to some MGL that dictates the uses out of the fund. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm just saying, it's, it's a silly analogy, but I'm thinking about back in the old days, banks, you know, c can co collect escrows every month for for taxes and insurance and so on and so forth. And there was a time when banks were holding huge amounts in escrow, um, much more than was needed to pay those bills. And the um, federal government passed a law limiting how much could be held. And so I'm just, I just wonder if, if there's any protection in place if these funds get to be way beyond the authorization we're making for each year in terms of spending. That's something the auditors would certainly <clears throat> flag if it. If any of these accounts grew to a point where there was a concern, then the auditors would put that on the, the selectmen's of radar. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And that happens. I mean, it hasn't. It doesn't happen here. It hasn't happened here. I've worked in communities where, <coughs> on the school side, some of these accounts have grown to the point that the auditors are saying this is a concern. And in fact, we saw this recently with the North Shore community where there were some accounts that had grown beyond what was acceptable in terms of balances in the accounts. Okay. Thank you. Uh, one, one question, because I think, if I remember correctly from last year, that's sort of a situation with the preservation fund where we have that money there, but they haven't been able to use it. They haven't been able to find anybody who qualifies and would actually take advantage of the... That's a very unique one because yeah. there, there's no funding source for you. I mean, there's no revenue for that right. program. It's just that um, one time. And they've struggled to find ex places to spend it. So the, it was converted from a loan program last year by town meeting to a grant program to try to use the money yeah. toward the, you know, the state admission. And then as a suggestion on the water use mitigation, which sort of goes in line with what we were able to do with the fields, perhaps we can look at somehow involving that with the Twy field and <coughs> somehow expending money there because I'm sure we would be able to develop a new irrigation system. You'll there see a little would, bit of that in the grounds yeah. article on Thursday where we've mm -hmm. been able to deploy. We have some, um, some sprinkler heads in particular that are very old and are getting replaced using some of these funds. But okay. I think that's a great that's a great suggestion. Thanks. Mike? All set? Ted. To piggyback off of that idea, are there creative ways we can mitigate water use in roof repairs? <laughs> and that you don't have to answer that question right now. In roof and I don't mean to be smirking. No, no, yeah. no. Roof repairs? Are there creative things we can do with roofs? Yeah, I th yeah, that absolutely. can recycle water. Especially and, one in, on and amplify the program. I mean, yeah. those roofs are flat. Maybe the Highlands or Riverside. Nah, I my wife, you know, <laughs> my wife, it's it's tangential, but you know, she's like, what if they just like instead of doing the whole roof over, what if they made part of it a garden? You know, like a mm -hmm. something like like a creative uses that could avoid some of the damage that we're going to. Yeah, I'm thinking more of fudging the numbers, but that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, I think look, we... We're not supposed to say that in a way. Well, you're going to see another... You'll see an article on Thursday. Um, we're proposing to... We, we know we have an access agreement in place with the alarm list to do some exploratory testing at the Rebecca Nurse Homestead, and we're proposing to use water use mitigation money to cover the engineering costs to do that mm -hmm. because we're looking at, you know, creating more municipal water sources, which will really, really you know, reduce impact on the Ipswich Basin, which is the stated purpose of the program in the first place. And I think the, the CONCOM is actually reviewing um, some components of the Smith School on Thursday, and I know one of our one of our staff planners has raised some issues. There are some questions about whether some of the runoff from that roof could be recaptured on site. So I think WUMP would be an appropriate place to look for some of that kind of stuff. Thanks, Ted. That's it for me. Gina. So we're voting on the maximum they can spend out of these funds every. So the 
the child care program has limited spots, correct? So if the demand exceeded the 640,000, they would just cap the number of children that were allowed in the program, is that correct? Or they'd come back and ask for a, a special town meeting to, okay. I mean, we, if, if it came to the, yeah, if it came to that, and I, I want to say one year, we, we may in, in one of the last four or five years had to revote one of these at the special town meeting within the annual town meeting to get to the end of the year, but I, I, off the top of my head, I can't recall the why. Okay. But yeah, this would, this would limit it to 640. That number used to be much lower when it, when but it that's, first yeah. started. Remember? Thanks. But, but I happen to know personally that sign up is pretty early uh, this year, so they know pretty, they, they have a pretty good idea right now who's going to be in the program for the year that starts July 1st. So yeah. There's um, no issues with competitiveness. We're not going to see any federal investigations of people using uh. insights to be able to get into that program. Right? Definitely. <laughs> no. <laughs> I think the DEP in the one program is a greater concern than anything else. Paul. Uh, thanks, Mike. Yeah, that was my question. <laughs> uh, so the, the, the colleagues have touched a, 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 an area that I was just concerned on. You look at these funds. I mean, there's nine of them, ten of them. I'm not sure how many. Nine. Nine. Uh, numbers two, three, and four, and five are all under the control of the Department of Land Use and Community Services. So th they control the va all that that pool of money, but it's all split up. Now, is there any way they can or cannot not allowed to take from two if they need money, then slip or, or if three needs money, transportation revolving fund account, and slide money over? That's no. a no-no. No. no. So they're, they're, therefore, they can't they're segregated. Go. Right. Okay. Um, you can as many terms as you want. <laughs> okay, then I'm all set. Mr. Bradstreet, did you have a question? Just an easy one. The uh, the funds that are held in these, they do generate interest, or is that part of the, this money is still in the town's coffers, so the town's coffers make money. These accounts stay the same. If there was money made off of them, it would stay with them or it would stay in the towns? I believe that floats to the general fund, but we'll get an answer okay. for you to be All right. sure. I know these, these are mostly in MMDT funds, so they're, they're, they're virtually non interest bearing. Oh, okay. Because a okay. comment was made, I know years and years ago, banks used to offer tax funds, vacation funds. You put so much money in the, in the account. Toaster. And at the end, uh, you got your money back. The bank kept the interest because they invested the funds. You didn't get any interest off. And that was why I was asking about uh, these. We're, we're doing a little better than the banks used to do them, or are we? Depends on what area you're talking about. Just making money. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Any other questions? Paul? Just a follow-up to what, so if you get the, um, one of the accounts you talked about, I think, uh, I'm not sure which one it was, that was it the waterways dredging that had an excess? The water use mitigation fund right, has. Right, okay, water use yeah. mitigation. You get to a point where you're not, you're, you're, you've got more than you need, let's say, okay, and it's a total sum, and the auditor comes in and says, you gotta look at this. For, no, then what do you do with the money? I mean, can you actually take that money and move it somewhere else, or? How do you handle it? I don't have an answer. Yeah, it depends on the enabling statute of the revolving fund. So depending on the fund, we'd have to. I mean, look it's into. money that's there. Yeah. And you keep growing that account, and yet, I mean, it sounds crazy because we we seem to be able to find a way to use money. And you just you just mentioned the uh, Rebecca nurse situation, but if we had that kind of sum, I'm just curious as to whether we could slide it into another needy fund, or does it have to be? Uh, Hand, you know, tied in with water somehow, or could it go somewhere else? I think it depends on the fund. So, for example, in a prior community, we had a vacant foreclosed fund mm -hmm. that we could just appropriate out into the general fund as we saw fit. Mm -hmm. Where one that's dictated by statute like water use, I'm not sure if we could just sweep that money yes. into free cash or into another fund. I, okay. okay. We eliminated one a couple of years ago. We had a fire Something. sticker emblem account, which never it virtually had no balance in it and we'd been carrying it from year to year and it had been dormant and we right. we just voted it okay. out of existence it'd be a very different story mm -hmm. if 
for example, you know, the child child care evolving fund where parents have paid fees in, we have a, there's a healthy balance in there because we have ongoing costs. If, if we suddenly propose to sweep that and put it into the Council on Aging to, you know, to beef up the, the ride sharing, I think beyond the angry parents, I think the Department of Local Services and DOR would have some, some problems with something like that. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Also, any other questions? Just one Sally. minor. I just think it would be useful if we could get the balances of all of these. It would just be yeah. interesting to see what they are. Thank you, Sally. And it might be helpful to remember that these funds, we're not talking about funding them from town monies, right. um, from, the, from the tax levy. They're all, each one is funded through a particular source, like the uh, water use mitigation fund is made up of revenues from the water mitigation impact fees that the town charges. The uh, child care program is funded totally from the uh, fees charged by the rec department for participation in the program. So our vote is just allowing the account to continue to exist, but we're not, we're not voting to fund them. Each one is self-funding in, in its own way. I don't think it would be difficult to, pro if you look at pages 26 and 27 of the warrant book where we show the balances for specific articles that have been approved, we, we've never historically included the revolving accounts there, but it wouldn't be yeah, difficult that. to offer a snapshot. Um, you know, the one, well, the one caveat we have to offer on some of those is that the, um, the timing of the money in and money out may be very cyclical. Sure. So for example, you might have a, a balance that looks quite large on March 31st that's virtually gone by May 15th based on the season starting or something like yep. that. But there's no downside, I don't think, they including that moving forward. Yeah. Okay. Is there a motion? I move the question. Seconded. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <coughs> Bruins lead two to one. Oh, thank you. Good. Thank you. I thought that was going to be the fastest uh, article. Of the I know this is, this is the most interesting conversation we've ever had yep. in our voting accounts. Thank you. Well, the Tigers won the beginning of the doubleheader today. If anyone else in the cares about that, I had tickets to that. I, I had tickets. To I had tickets game. to that. Uh, I'm here. Yeah, I had tickets to tonight's game <laughs> for the Bruins and Cam. Oh, yeah, so, how yeah. important you guys are to me. <laughs> Well, moving right along, <laughs> Article 37 is our School of Construction Stabilization Fund um, article. Um, you know, we <clears throat> I think every we don't need to spend a lot of time talking about where we are with the Smith School, but um, you know, we're the, it's hitting the FY20 budget. We had originally thought it was going to hit the FY21 budget, so this is the, the first year where we've seen a sizable um, reduction out of that account. And this article is recommending that we uh, put $750,000 in free cash back into that account. Um, you'll see our our balance um, right now is at 5.9 million. That'll be the high water mark. Um, we're we're recommending 2.3 million come out this year, with 750 going back in. So our balance at the end of FY20 will be around 4.25 million dollars. Um, and um, just as a as a reminder, a refresher when we when we were looking um, in January at you know what we thought we needed under the 30 year level debt funding model to do this project. We'll need a total of $8.3 million during the peak debt years. Um, so we never need that account to hit 8.3. The point is, as we draw down the money, we need to be putting um, the difference between the 5.9 and the 8.3 back in. So roughly $2.4 million between now and FY26. So 750 would be the first piece of that to, to help us get through um, what, would be, what we would project to be the peak debt years based on current assumptions. I'm happy to take any questions on this particular article. Yeah. Paul? I'm all set. Gina? No questions. Ted? I just want to make sure I understand how this works. So in our budget, we've got 750000 budgeted in the annual budget. And we're taking that basically out of free cash and moving it into the stabilization fund, perm per not permanently, but it's and it's staying there. And that's basically counted as an expense on the no. annual budget. So in the 20 budget, we'd be using 2.3 out of the fund. Okay. And we're asking to replenish 750 back into the fund for future use, yeah. Okay. So this 750 that's going out of free cash this year will be used in Later 21 years. or 22. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Okay. If that's what you're asking. I'm sorry. Yeah. I didn't understand the question. Mike? All set. Mike? No, I'm good. Thanks. Sally? I have no questions. Thanks. Sally? All set. Thank you. Great. Any questions from the audience? Move the article. Seconded. 
All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Great. 38. Article 38, uh, we, we discussed this briefly at the beginning of the night. Um, we have roughly one and a half million dollars in our general stabilization fund, which is a, um, it's a recognized stabilization fund by the state. Um, for many years uh, at the annual town meeting, uh, town meeting would appropriate money from free cash into the stabilization fund and then appropriate money out of the stabilization fund to fund the capital. Um, so you'll notice in the, at, the, at the front of your budget book a couple of years ago we shifted that practice um, and so we started funding the capital directly out of free cash instead of having that <coughs> up and down and churn in the general stabilization fund. This recommendation is sort of a second step in that direction where um, you know, our, our stated free cash policy says that we're going to have 1% remaining in free cash at the end of town meeting. Um, but if we were to expend all of that free cash, we would, we would never be able to claw our way back into compliance on the fund balance policy. So what this is saying is that the, the amount of money above that 1% is being redirected into the general stabilization fund where ideally it will stay. Um, and the goal year over year to the extent that we can would be to grow the stabilization fund so that it essentially forms the bulk of our unassigned fund balance. It's a number that um, is understood sort of from coast to coast, unlike free cash, which is really just a creature of Massachusetts. Um, so this, this shift from free cash into the stabilization fund would bring the balance up to a little over $3 million. Um, and both, again, both categories count in unassigned fund balance, so there'd be no, no hit in terms of the audit. And we, we, that was a 9 p.m. explanation, but I'm happy, that Ronnie and I are being happy to questions you have on this. Sally? Sally? Good, thank you. So your, your, your proposal or, or the goal here is that however we call, whatever we call the fund, uh, but we'll refer to it as sta stabilization fund, that's where we'll fund capital projects from this? No, you'll continue to fund them from? Um, in, in a perfect world, we would have a new, I mean, eventually we'd, we'd, be, we'd be trying to figure out a way to do a new line item in the budget for capital you know, part of our capital budget. This would be separate from that. This is an amount um, we, we appropriate into it at town meeting, but we would like for it not to be part of the budget process at all, other than to eventually, if the budget's going up by 2.5%, we try to increase this fund by 2.5% and have it track the budget. And, and have it, we could point to it as the town's reserve. This is where we look when the next recession hits or something like that. Yeah. Sort of truly a rainy day. Snowmageddon. Days. Snowmageddon, yes. Yeah. Sharknado. Okay, got it. Thank you. <laughs> Mike. And, and from s sort of a practical operational standpoint, though, right now, there's no real difference between us having it in here or free cash in terms of what None. we can. None, except that when we, when we sit and talk with Standard & Poor's or Moody's or anybody else, <coughs> if we can point to having a $3 million general state, that makes a lot more sense to them than saying that we have free, $3 million in free cash yeah. that's sitting there. We I mean, can't invest it any differently or. And both, you know, we can't, the money doesn't get, it re both require town meeting appropriation out, so um, it's really optics. We think this is this is where the money should sit. <coughs> it's part of it's part of the reserve that we have to have anyone. Yeah. Mike, uh, the 4.24 million free cash number you gave us, this 1.5 has already been factored into that, hasn't it? The uh, yeah, the the two at the you were talking about at the beginning of the presentation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, just the previous article says we're going to have after that uh, school stabilization fund. We're going to have 4.24 million. This would be this would be the balance in in the school stabilization fund. We have two we have two stabilization funds. We have the school construction stabilization fund, oh, which right. we used to offset that. Yep. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. Thank you. Ted, what's the interest that we earn on this thing? That's a good question. We'll find out. So the short answer is not much. This, I mean, I don't think this this doesn't function as an investment account the same way that the OPEB trust, for example, yeah. would. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, OPEB, you're investing in like right. yeah. real assets. We'll have an answer as opposed to yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, we, don't want we to can off. we can take it off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll we'll have an answer for that on Thursday. Great. Gina, well, that's a good question. So, where is the money kept? Is it in a deposit account or is it in a separate? Or is it just separated on the books? It would be in a set. Should be in a separate deposit account. Okay. But I, I, I don't believe that the, where our free cash sits is going to look a whole lot different from where the general stabilization fund sit, but I think we'll, for Thursday we'll have an answer on that. We, we wouldn't be in a position to, to tie it up anyways. We wouldn't be able to, for example, say we're going to put this into a three-year. No, we wouldn't yeah. buy it. Yeah, yeah. no. Yeah. I think if I'm Yeah, but there's a difference between zero and, like, even, you know, you can get CDs right now, that three-month CDs at 2.5%. Right. Yeah. 
I, I was think we all agree. Yeah, yeah, you know, we'd all agree that we're probably not going to be spending it in the next two months right. or three months. That's all. I was anticipating yeah. the next question, which is that we wouldn't necessarily want to put this money on the open market and potentially experience a twenty percent decline because it's no, going to. Of course not. Yeah, no. But there's uh, a yeah. lot of we have a lot of options in between that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep. Right. No, understood. We hear, yeah, we hear that. Paul. So we're taking one. Point five million from free cash, moving it into the sta general stable this stabilization fund. It does earn interest or no? It does. Free cash earns nothing. Depending on where the free cash exists, yeah. it could potentially earn interest. But would there ever be an instance where we wanted to move from the stabilization fund back to free cash? No, because town meeting would be appropriating out of either source for for expenditure. So if we so needed something that we thought, well, if we had. X amount in free cash, but we, we can't say to ourselves, oh, we can't do it because we have the stabilization fund to do it. So either way, we get to use it. Yeah. Correct? Okay. I'm all set. So and, and, I, and I guess I'll just say that most importantly, both of these categories, if you have your unassigned fund balance umbrella, both of these categories sit underneath that. Mm -hmm. if, if this sat outside of that umbrella, we wouldn't be recommending this because we'd be right. hurting ourselves on our, our okay. broader fund balance policy. Any questions from the audience? Great. Move Stay. the article. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Great. The OPEB Trust Fund. <laughs> the, this is the third amigo. Um, so we've talked about the school stabilization fund. We've talked about the uh, general stabilization fund and uh, the OPEB Trust Fund. Um, and, uh, and again, I think that the folks in this room are, are probably very familiar with the move um, you know, Danvers established a stabilization fund to account for these expenses back in the mid, in the early 2000s. Uh, several years ago, town meeting voted to move to convert the stabilization fund into a trust fund, um, and so we were able to start earning interest, um, uh, real you know, get a real return. I think in the first year in the in the uh, trust fund, we earned more than we had in the preceding 15 years while it was sitting in a stabilization fund. Um, so it was a it was a prudent move. And um, I see Rodney has his slides from the budget process, but we've we've committed ourselves to a five-year funding schedule for this. Uh, unlike pension, there is no date by which towns have to be fully funded. In part because our liability today is 190 million dollars, and and um, uh, OPEB is other post-employment benefits, which is retiree health care. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, because of some uh, some new GASB requirements that figures now being fully reflected on the town's balance sheet so Danvers like a lot of communities including Andover and others technically have a negative uh, fund you know position right now because of this liability the good news is um, as you can see we have 6.3 million dollars set aside that's uh, not a not a large number relative to the overall liability but it believe it or not it's a, it's ahead of where a lot of communities are right now um, and so the key for us from the rating agency's perspective is not necessarily that we commit ourselves to a fully funded date, but that we're showing progress. Um, so as I noted, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're currently doing $350,000 um, out of free cash toward this. The utilities, you know, water, sewer, and electric are also making uh, contributions based on their schedules. Um, it's a number we need to increase. We're not in a position to do that yet, but we've been able to show a $50,000 year over year increase the last three or four years, and that would be the recommendation again this year. Um, and it, you know, as you'll see, that by the end of next year, we'll have a little over $7 million in this trust. Do you want to add anything to that? No. Okay. Paul? We'll never fully fund this, correct? Um, yes. I mean, yes and no. I, I, I mean, there are, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of really well-run communities that have basically decided they're just going to treat this as a pay-as-you-go mm -hmm. liability. Okay. Um, in part because unlike pension, which is very, which is formulaic you know you know the, the peer act issues regs the legislature passes laws and it says that it's going to be you know 80 percent of your last five years um salary once you hit a certain number of years in the system actuaries can calculate that out based on mortality rates et cetera, et cetera. so it's a lot easier to project out and i and i think i've said this before if anybody in this room can tell us what health care is going to cost in 20 years and they shouldn't be sitting in this room they should be making a lot of money somewhere um, it's a big number. The, the state recognizes it's a big number. The federal government recognizes it's a big number. Whether there's a solution forthcoming in the near term, I think, is probably doubtful. Um, but you know, the, the, something's got to give. I mean, Governor Patrick talked about reform to for, for OPEB reform 
um, had a bill, didn't get, didn't get across the finish line. Uh, when Governor Baker was elected, he talked about wanting to have a, an OPEB reform bill. Didn't happen during the first term. Um, the administration continues to say something like they'd like to try to tackle during the second term. You know, what would the effect be if they actually tackled the bill like that and passed it? On a, I mean, what, what, what are we looking at that, at that point? It depends on what they pass. Yeah. Right? If, you're, if you're making structural changes to the healthcare market that, that drop fees and, and, and costs and things like that, you'd see that number drop because mm -hmm. the assumptions baked into our unfunded liability would drop. Um, okay. You know, something towns and cities can do is change the, the cost sharing between retirees and, and the organization. So we, the town funds 70% of healthcare costs for active employees. It also funds 70% of healthcare costs for retirees. The town can move that to 50-50. That would have a significant impact on the unfunded liability, but it would also be cost shifting to retirees, which is not a politically um, smart move necessarily for. Right. But but that's you know these are some of the these are some of the tools and mechanisms we have. Um, you could change your health, you know, plan, which is something we're discussing right now with the IAC, which would have an impact. There would be a ripple effect through to, to OPEB on that. Sure. But for that number to change significantly, it's going to require reform that's way outside of our, you know, right. jurisdiction. Okay. Thank you. Gina? So we're not paying anything out of this fund, right? We're just... <clears throat> not, uh, not right okay. now. And so la uh, when we approved the retiree budget out of general government for the 450 retirees, six and a half million, is that where current benefits are paid out of? No, no. so the, the retiree health care is coming out of the benefits and insurance budget. Oh, benefits. And, and the retirement budget is strictly pension. Pension. Okay. Thank you for clarifying. Yeah, so the, and the, and what's being, so the, the, um, sort of the, the pay as you go is being funded out of the operating budget and then the trust is being funded out of the, out of the operating budgets for the utilities, but it, currently it's out of free cash for the, for the general fund, which again is something we, you know, we'd love to see that change somehow so that we could build a line item into the tax support budget to start paying for this. Okay. Thank you. Ted? Are, are we beginning to chase down that number or is it getting bigger on us every year? The net. So I mean, 190 minus 6.3, right <clears throat> is that number bigger than it was? I'm guessing it's probably getting bigger just because it's healthcare cost inflation, right? It's a combination yeah. of both, yeah. yeah. That's it. What's that? <clears throat> Mike? Is, is there any restriction on us eventually using this? It has to be for qualifying expenses, but, you know, for example, it's just kind of pie in the sky, but if, if universal health healthcare fell out of the sky tomorrow, next year, um, and suddenly our healthcare costs drop precipitously, they're never going to go to zero, and we could use the trust money to offset those costs. Sure. So we'll always we'll always have medical qualifying medical expenses that this money can be at. Can or, be or if we got into some catastrophic situation in terms of in, of, of expenses, we could use this to right, offset right. that in the, in the general medical, budget. I think that's, yeah. Sally, thank you. Um, <clears throat> retirees are are retirees required to um, get onto Medicare when they are age eligible? So th th I imagine that had a downward impact on this liability. That w I think we did that probably several, several years ago. ago. And, I remember. And it certainly would have helped. Mm -hmm. But I think, I mean, I, I recall having this conversation with Wayne and Diane, and I think that they were shocked that it didn't have a greater impact hmm. on this number. And, and I think part of the reason for that is that we have, Danvers has a, it, not Danvers, most municipalities in Massachusetts have a, a group who are eligible to retire at 55. So there's a 10-year window where they are retirees on the health plan before they qualify for Medicare, mm -hmm. police, fire, electric, so the group four retirees. Um, and that's an expensive sort of that, that gap 10 years, yeah. That. And then we have a very small number who, and we're learning because we're going through this process right now, were hired prior to 1986, um, so never paid into Medicare, and therefore don't qualify for Medicare. So we have some active retirees currently who are not eligible for free Medicare. Got it. That are on the counts plan. Of course, that group will get smaller the further yes. we get from 86. Um, you mentioned that water and sewer are also uh, will also be making contributions to this fund. Electric as well? Yes. Correct. Okay. I just wasn't sure if I just didn't write fast enough to get it. Those were my questions. Thank you. Sally? Uh, what's 
See, average, I, I mean, I generally think we're doing about as well as we can do. It's, it's such a huge, huge problem but, or a challenge. But what's the average age um, of, I mean, are a lot of people sticking around longer than we thought? Or what's the, how many retirees? Sorry. In the, in the, audience. In the audience. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. If you wish me dead, that's one. <laughs> so the, the actuaries call that positive attrition. I'm not sure we would call it, we would use that terminology, but um, I mean, people are living longer. Yeah. You know, I'm just, I, I'm sure everyone saw the, the story, was following the story about the T and people retiring at, in their 40s. That's, I mean, that's not So that's not, happening. you know, a concern here. But I've, I wondered back in my legislative days if we shouldn't have started to reduce, it's an awful thing to say, but to trim back perhaps on costs by saying, you know, in 10 years at that point, the benefits packages won't be as robust as they are now, that maybe it would be a greater cost share closer to, you know, 25.75 or something like that. That'd be the opposite direction, actually. No, she's saying the, 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 no, the I'm saying town where, only pays 25 percent. But we pay 70 for That's what she's saying. Right. She's saying that at okay, 10, so, 10 right? Well, then, whichever way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. We're, which, yeah, I mean. So, I mean, that, that, that's an option. Yeah. I don't know. Now, is that, is that covered by collective bargaining, though, in that if you are in a collective bargaining unit and you leave from a collective bargaining unit, you are therefore eligible to retain whatever benefits you had in that bargaining unit? When you, when you say leave a collective bargaining so unit? So you, you when you retire yeah. from, so if I'm, in a, if I'm working in the electric light division and I. You know what that's saying? Oh, I yeah. No, right. no. Here it's no. Okay. So it's whatever has been negotiated. But if we want to change the retiree split, we do have to negotiate. Negotiate that, that with yeah. the, yeah, that's right. Okay. Any questions from the audience? Bill? He has an announcement to make on OPEB reform. <laughs> Can somebody help me? $190 million. When is that due? That's, I mean, that's, I don't understand that number. The, uh, so uh, the term, I haven't used it yet tonight, but we call it that, we, we view that as a squishy number, Bill, it, for a lot of the reasons we've already discussed. Nobody knows what health care is going to cost in 25 years. I think everybody in this room can agree that the current trend for health care costs is entirely unsustainable, but the question is when there's going to be uh, a willingness to address it at the state or the federal level, because it's outside of our ability. I mean, we as a town cannot control the cost of prescription drugs or medical um, services or hospital fees or ambulance fees or anything like that. We can only try to design a plan that, um, you know, balances and minimizes the, the, the cost of the plan with the ability to pay for the plan. Um, so, so you though, Mr. Chairman, it, it, it's $190 million. We're paying 12, I thought it was 15, but you say it's 12 and a half million a year for, for health benefits for including current and uh, retired employees. So it's, it's 12 and a half million a year. It, 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 190 million is a fictitious figure, if you will, because you can t tell me when it's due. When is the 190 due? I'm going to call your office tomorrow, uh, <laughs> and we can have that conversation. We'll flip. The, we'll turn the tables a little bit, and I'll ask. I'll ask the same question because I think we should ask my boss. But <laughs> but I'm asking you, the 190 <laughs> million is 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 a, yes, I, it's worried me for the few years that we've but talked I, about it. But it's a, a yeah. fictitious figure, <laughs> right? I mean, what is it? So the, again, I mean, I. The reason that there is a, the reason that the state has determined that the pension system needs to be fully funded by 2040 is because it is a defined benefit that can be calculated out that far based on Actuary. The, the, the assumptions today are much more solid than they are. We're not anywhere near close to seeing, um, you know, rules coming down from the state saying that we have to have this fully funded by a certain date. Our response would be as soon as you can pass that OPEB reform package you've been talking about for a decade, then we'll, we'll get serious with our constituents about talking about how to, how to comply with that funding schedule. 
for the time being, we need to show progress. We need to be able to show that we're increasing the amount that we're setting aside, that we're, that we're acknowledging the cost. Um, I think the town's taken some really important steps. Step one was establishing the stabilization fund and setting aside what it could in, in 2006 or seven. And then step two, when town meeting created the trust a couple years ago, was a really important step. Um, and right now, you know, that 350 needs to be a little bigger next year. And if we can get it into the tax levy, that's another good step. Um, but, you know, doing the math, to, to be, if we were to try to fund this in the next four years, we'd be talking about a 10, million, 10 or $15 million <laughs> a year appropriation to cover that liability. And that's, but the bill's that's not impossible. Right. It's not 190 million due right now. Well, which is why I said, you know, a lot of, I, I've worked in communities that have been very well run communities, and their attitude was, we'll treat this as a pay go. We're not going to. We're not going to contort ourselves to try to cover a cost that's subject to change in the next 5, 10, 15 years. Any other comments? Move the article. Seconded. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Great. We don't have to work. Do we not make any? Um, for I know Article 41, we don't make a motion. Yeah. 40, do we do anything? You can, yeah, we would vote on 40. Okay. So the, the um, these are pretty, so each year um, we look at our outstanding authorized debt and we look for areas where we can rescind some of that debt to bring down our, you know, what we have on the books for, for authorized but unapproved. This year, the, uh, last year we didn't have any. This year we have two small rescissions that are being proposed. One, um, you know, back in 2008, uh, Collins Street uh, was part of a TIP uh, road reconstruction program. That project never happened. Um, so, you know, safe to say a decade later we're, we're recommending we rescind this authorization. If that project circles back around, we can always reauthorize we can always reauthorize um, the, the bond. But um, this is one that we're we're able to rescind. And then um, the smaller one, but I, one that's sort of a good story, or you know, positive bit of news. Uh, when we were doing our uh, police station dispatch center a few years ago, we had uh, town meeting had appropriated or authorized five and a half million dollars to do that project. We were getting close to uh, bid opening date around in the run up to town meeting. Um, Escalation was looking like the, the five and a half million wasn't going to be sufficient, so town meeting appropriated or authorized an additional two hundred thousand. Um, the bids were open; we were able to achieve some savings on the project, and so the the project was uh, completed for under the original appropriation of five and a half million. So, um, the two hundred thousand can be rescinded from. Yeah. That's great. Any questions on that? Is there a motion? I'll move the article. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. <laughs> Would you like to have this list? Article 41, do you just want to? 41 is there just in case, summary? you know, the bills or, yeah, really, Linda decided that they want to mess budget. around uh, with good. the budget during town meeting and we have so to make any offsetting changes Thursday at the end of town meeting. Yeah. So. Is that a new article that we have always had that? Yeah. yeah. Yep. So this is this is in the event that amendments are proposed and passed at town meeting and it has an impact on the levy, we would need to have this at the end to make mm -hmm. offsetting adjustments. Oh right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're back Thanks. Thursday night. Yeah, Thursday. Uh, and we certainly will. The, it, it does sound like just for clarification for all of the members of the finance committee, we will need to have a finance committee meeting prior to. The annual town meeting. Correct. Yep. What time would that be? Uh, Usually it's seven. Seven o'clock. Seven. Yeah. What, what is that for? That is to um, for the special oh, town meeting okay. uh, for the exact amounts of the. Uh, it's usually in the Mills room at the high school. We usually do it right up at the table where we'll sit for the rest of the I thought yeah. we did it in the Mills room. Oh, do, do it? Last year we did it at the front of the hall, but yeah, I think okay. anyway. You should, we'll you should just get it. Silent. Whatever, we'll figure it out. Yeah. I was thinking the auditorium was the Mills room. Yeah. 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 No, but thank you all. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Oh, a meeting adjourned. <laughs>